Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Georgia Williams was born in Shropshire, England on September the 17th, 1995. From the time that she was born, she was a ray of sunshine and full of life. She was born into a very tight-knit family. Her father Stephen, who was a detective with the West Mercia Police, her mother Lynette and an older sister, Scarlett. The family would do anything for one another. Georgia was a straight-A student and head girl at her school. She hadn't always had the easiest of times, struggling with school bullies in her early teens. But by the time she was 17, she really was thriving. She had a part-time job at a petrol station and a great group of friends. She was even a cadet in the Air Training Corps, hoping one day to become a Royal Air Force paramedic. With her big dreams, an infectious personality, and a smile that you couldn't ignore, Georgia was a force to be reckoned with. On May the 26th, 2013, Georgia was at a family barbecue. It was a warm evening and everyone was in high spirits. At around 7.30pm, Georgia left the family barbecue to meet up with some of her friends for a photo shoot. There was a group of them and they were trying to help out 23-year-old Jamie Reynolds. He was one of the full-time workers at the same petrol station as Georgia. Jamie had a keen interest in photography and wanted to pursue it as a career, a big dream from simply working at a petrol station. Georgia and the rest of their friends encouraged him and they offered to help him in any way that they could. And on this particular evening, he took the group up on their offer to model for some photos, just a little something he could use in his portfolio. Jamie's parents' house was only a few minutes away on foot, so after letting her family know she would be back later, she headed off down the street. Her family continued with their barbecue, enjoying another UK summer. A few hours went by with no word from Georgia, so her mother Lynette sent a text message asking how everything was going and when they should expect her back home. She received a text back saying that although the photo shoot was done, she was going to hang out with her friends for a while longer and that she didn't know when she would be coming back home. She put her usual three kisses at the end of the message. On Monday morning, Mother Lynette woke up at 6am. She noticed that George's bed had not been slept in. Lynette started to get concerned and sent another text to her phone asking where she was at. She finally got a response a few hours later. She said that she lost track of time and stayed over at her friend's place, but she forgot to message her to let her know. At the end of the message, she said, My battery is dying too. Lynette knew that this wasn't right. Georgia would never want to cause any worry to anyone and she never failed to let anyone know where she was. That morning, Georgia was supposed to go to a music festival and then take a driving lesson. If she wasn't home for these things, then something had to be wrong. It got to Tuesday morning and there was still no word from Georgia. Her parents now really started to panic. They started calling her friends to see if anyone had seen or heard from her, but all of them said no. Her parents went straight to the police to make a missing persons report. Her parents told the police that she had spent the evening at Jamie Reynolds' family home with their friends. They didn't know too much about him, other than the fact that he seemed to be a quiet and polite boy. They knew that Jamie had started to develop a liking for Georgia, something that he didn't hide. And they also knew that Georgia did not share the same feelings towards him. She rejected his advances but she was more than happy to help him with his dream of being a photographer. Georgia was just the type of person who would be anyone's friend. She wanted to make sure that everyone felt included. Perhaps this is due to her history of bullying. But when the police did a background check on Jamie, what they found was disturbing. In 2008, when he was 17 years old, he had attempted to strangle a 16-year-old girl, luring her under false pretenses of helping her with a school project. He somehow then got off with only a warning, 
and the youth offending team at mental health services made visits to assess the situation further. His parents told the team that he had been obsessed with violent adult content and films involving asphyxiation. He also had disturbing drawings of schoolgirls in uniforms with nooses around their necks. After the mental health team's visit, they determined that he was a significant risk and relayed this information to the police. Unfortunately though, the police did not take any further action. They believed the case had been suitably resolved. The police got straight to searching for Jamie, who wasn't at home. But with the help of CCTV and number plate recognition, Jamie and his van were seen at a cheap hotel almost 300 miles away in Glasgow, Scotland. But there was no sign of Georgia Williams. Shropshire police contacted the police in Scotland, and he was found and taken in for questioning. He claimed to know nothing about Georgia's whereabouts. The police were not satisfied and arrested him on suspicion of kidnap, bringing him back to Shropshire for further questioning. But Jamie continued to deny all allegations. The detectives headed back towards George's last known location, Jamie's house. They conducted a thorough and in-depth search, looking for any signs of her whereabouts. No one could have predicted what they would find. They discovered 16,800 images and 72 videos of extreme adult material on his computer. But given his background, this was hardly surprising. After previously being let off with a warning, we can surmise that he felt like he had free reign to do this. But what they came across next was horrifying even to the most experienced of investigators. They found a camera in the house, its memory card wiped clean. But fortunately, whoever had wiped the data had not done a good job. Investigators were able to recover the data, and this data told the full story. A grainy video clip showed a happy and bubbly Georgia, grinning at the camera with a noose around her neck. This was on the landing of Jamie's house whilst he took pictures. But seconds later, Jamie Reynolds was throttling Georgia with that same rope. The pictures and video showed that Georgia had been forced on top of a box. He had built a terrifying hanging mechanism, mounted in the loft hatch of his parents' semi-detached home. He had convinced Georgia to willingly put the noose around her neck. And then Jamie kicked the box right from underneath her. And there Georgia was suspended by the neck. She had been photographed and videoed like this all over his house. Then after he was done, he had violated her body. The detectives found a script, five months worth of work he'd put into a twisted tale. A tale where he described ending Georgia in this very manner. The officers re-arrested Jamie and charged him with the murder of Georgia Williams. Even after her death, he continued to play twisted games. He refused to tell investigators where her body was hidden. Instead, the police had to use a timeline of Jamie's movements, covering the days after Georgia's disappearance. The day after Georgia went missing, CCTV footage showed Jamie filling up his van with fuel. In the back of the van was Georgia's body. He then drove 60 miles to Wrexham where he had stopped to watch a film in a cinema. The film was The Fast and the Furious. With Jamie in custody, the police had gone to the public for help. Police say they need information to fill a gap of about five and a half hours in Cheshire heading north. Many people did come forward saying that they, in fact, did see Jamie and that they had helped him at the side of the road when his van got stuck. From here, the police searched and searched. Five days after she had gone missing, they found the unclothed remains of Georgia Williams. She was barely hidden, abandoned in a wooded area near Wrexham. For her family, this wasn't really closure. It was merely devastating. 
Friends of Georgia expressed the feelings of many in this Shropshire community who've been stunned at this awful turn of events. It's just complete shock that it's happened to one of our friends, that someone who wouldn't even harm a fly. It's just strange and weird that it's happened. She's a lovely person to be around. Like, like she'd walk into a room and the room would brighten with a smile. She's just the most intelligent person I knew. And clever, pretty. It's lovely in every way. On December the 2nd, 2013, Jamie Reynolds appeared at the Stafford Crown Court. Before he entered the courtroom, he was laughing and joking, showing not one ounce of remorse for what he had done. As he entered the room, his demeanour changed to meek and mild. Jamie Reynolds then pleaded guilty to murder. This was a relief to the family of Georgia. They would not have to endure the harrowing pictures, showing their daughter's final moments as part of a jury trial. In his final remarks, the judge laid bare the case in front of him. Jamie had written storylines, over 40 of them, where the predominant theme was killing a young woman and then violating her body. Many of the victims in these stories were real girls that he knew and named, girls including Georgia. He'd written of her entrapment, her untimely death, and he carried it out to a T on that fateful evening. After describing her hanging from the rope, he had written, I can't wait to see you dance with me. I like my girls dead. He lured her with the pretense of a photo shoot that merely mimicked hanging. After placing a noose around her neck and securing her to a contraption created in a loft hatch, he suddenly pulled the noose tight and kicked away the box on which she had been standing. Within minutes, he was taking photographs of her body before violating her repeatedly. He then sent the text message to her mother from her phone in an elaborate deceit. This was to give the impression that she had left his home safely. He then used his stepfather's van to load her body, her clothes and her jewellery, and drove her to a remote area in North Wales where he disposed of the body. And then he bought a new watch went to the cinema and checked into a hotel for the night. He thought he'd gotten away with it, but he clearly hadn't. Psychiatrists who examined the depraved 23-year-old had said if he had not been caught, he would progress to become a serial killer. In fact, in the lead up to the very weekend when Georgia was killed, Jamie sent messages to 16 other young women, inviting them over for a photographic shoot involving simulating hanging. Like he told Georgia, he said it was for his portfolio. Two or three of them showed interest and he made plans with them for later on that week. That was if for some reason things didn't go according to plan with Georgia. So this wasn't a one-off. This was the work of a sick and twisted sadistic killer. On December the 19th, he was given the hardest sentence possible under British criminal law. A full life order, meaning he will never get out of prison. He became one of the youngest people in British criminal history to receive this kind of sentence. Jamie had appealed this sentence. But the Court of Appeals said there's no possible way a whole life order could be argued against, and that his sentence was just. With this, his appeal was quickly denied. He will never see freedom again. Sarah Pappenheim was born January 30th, 1997 in Minnesota. She was the second child of her parents, mother Doni Odegaard and father Jerry Pappenheim. She had an older brother named Josh and the two only got closer as they grew older. When Sarah was in second grade, her family moved from Minneapolis to Redding, California. Here she discovered a love for music, in particular drums. After graduating from Foothill high school in 2015, she became an accomplished drummer. She could often be found playing in weekly jam sessions at Reading's music venues. It was hard not to notice Sarah, not only because she was a great drummer, but she was also one of the few females on stage. 
At the age of 18, Sarah returned to her native Minnesota with her mom and brother. She went on to play drums at various venues in Minnesota, and by the age of 19, Sarah had become a kind of local celebrity amongst blues fans. With an amazing wide smile, Sarah was nicknamed Ronald McDonald. However, while Sarah thrived, her brother Josh was struggling. Their parents had divorced and he was battling with depression and mental health problems. In February of 2016, sadly this all got too much for him and Josh snuffed out his own light. He was just 20 years old. Sarah was understandably devastated, but rather than let the pain consume her, she decided to study psychology to help people with mental health problems in the future. She was determined that in some ways her brother's memory would live on. Sarah had a close friend, Nico Carson Major, who lived in the Netherlands. Now ready for a fresh start, Sarah decided to enrol at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and there she began to study psychology. Nico helped Sarah through the loss of her brother, helped her with her studies, and generally as a native speaker, helped her in any way that he could. It was a new country, she didn't speak the language, and she was going through a hard time. So Sarah leaned on Nico a lot. In fact, they leaned on each other. As Sarah immersed herself in studies and work, her love of music returned. She wrote to Bernard Allison, a famous blues singer, with whom she had once performed on the same stage as, telling him that she had almost saved up the money to buy the drum kit that she had dreamed of for so long. When he toured Europe in 2017 with his band, Sarah and Nico went to the show. As soon as Bernard spotted her, he immediately called her to the stage. And after wishing her a happy birthday, he invited Sarah to sit at the drum kit and take part in a performance, just like in the good old days. Things were different, there was no denying that. But Sarah was finally starting to feel like herself again. As 2018 came to a close, she was ready to go home and spend some time in the United States. She booked a flight for the week before New Year's Eve, excited to see her mum and dad and return to the family home. She was definitely ready. However, Sarah never made it home. She never got the chance to get on that flight. Sarah lived on the third floor of an apartment complex in Rotterdam. The complex was filled with students and had a certain buzz about it. There was always something going on. Sarah had rented an apartment there for around a year, sharing with another student, a fellow musician who played the double bass. He was named Joel Schelling. Joel was talented and loved music, therefore music was their common ground, but it was probably their only common ground. Sarah was very outgoing, happy and an optimistic person, but Joel was not. His only friend was Sarah, and he often lost his temper with her. They often quarrelled, but Sarah didn't want to leave him alone with his problems. Although we don't know, some have theorised that Joel was a reminder of her own lost brother, and perhaps she wanted to make sure there was someone there to save him. She told her mother that she could always calm Joel down when he got mad at someone, saying he would never hurt her as she knew how to talk him down. However, as time passed, the situation began to deteriorate. In December of 2018, Sarah wrote to her friend Adam in Wisconsin. She told Adam that she was now afraid of her roommate, Joel. Joel had told her he was going to physically eliminate three people who he didn't like. Sarah wrote, I have to go to the police. A few days later, Sarah had spoken to her mum on the phone. She'd raised the same concerns. Her roommate's behaviour was now bothering her more and more. Mother Doni told her daughter to look for another place to live immediately, and until she moved out she was to try and stay as far away from Joel as possible. And yes, from the outside, Joel did sound unhinged, but was he serious or was he just being melodramatic? On the 12th of December 2018, a Wednesday, everything changed. 
At 12.20pm, Sarah and Joel's next-door neighbour called the police. They reported hearing them fighting loudly and then a female screaming in horror. When the police arrived and entered the apartment, they found Sarah lying unconscious on the floor. She had multiple marks made by a sharp implement all over her body. Attempts by emergency services to resuscitate her were sadly unsuccessful. It was too late. Sarah was already gone. Joel, her roommate, was not there. Interviewing neighbours on the same floor, officers learned that Joel had left the apartment in a hurry and he had taken his double bass with him. Yes, that's right, this tortured soul musician fled the scene with his giant double bass. Unable to hide it in his backpack, Joel was rather conspicuous as he tried to flee. Less than two hours after the crime was committed, 23-year-old Joel was arrested at Eindhoven train station about six 60 miles from Rotterdam. His parents lived in Eindhoven and he was on his way to visit them. He called his mother whilst on the train and confessed to her that he had taken Sarah's life. The autopsy revealed 27 wounds made by a sharp implement on Sarah's body. Several of these were in the neck, abdomen and back. This was a frenzied and sustained attack on his roommate, on his one and only friend. A friend who had only ever tried to help him. Sarah had not gone to the police to report that her roommate wanted to attack three people, but she had contacted social workers who help people with psychological difficulties. This was very telling of Sarah's kind nature. She may have seen Joel as a threat, but it seems she didn't want to get him into trouble, but she did want to get him help. The social workers did pay Joel a visit, but they got the impression that he was totally normal. He answered all of their questions and was calm and straightforward. There was nothing untowards about his demeanour or his behaviour. He was fine, or so they told Sarah. However, on the following day, Sarah was again forced to contact social services. This time, in a fit of anger, Joel had begun to beat himself with a hammer and said that he would soon have to do away with several people. Sarah was now afraid that Joel would find out that she was the one who had sent the social workers to talk to him, but she still knew that she needed to get him help. However, the social workers did not have time to respond to Sarah's second request. Quest. This is because Joel had already ended her life. Joel did confess to the crime, but you guessed it, he said he couldn't remember any of it. He offered no answers as to why, how or when. According to him, they began to argue, although he wasn't sure why. And then when he came to, he was already in the shower cleaning himself. His story obviously brought no comfort to Sarah's family but at least they knew that Joel was now in custody. Joel Schelling went on trial in March of 2019. Sarah's mother flew to each hearing. There, she could only understand what the participants were saying with the help of an interpreter. At the trial, Joel argued insanity. He stated that he suffered from schizophrenia, from delirium, and that he heard voices in his head. When the judge asked him if the voices had ordered him to fight with Sarah, he replied that he did not know and could not remember. He also repeated that he didn't know what they had begun to fight about. Various experts said that Joel suffered from various disorders and needed long-term treatment. At the same time, they concluded that he should still be held partly responsible for taking Sarah's life. The medics reasoned that Joel remembered the beginning of the fight and a scuffle with Sarah, and therefore he could have made a choice to stop or to go and grab the knife. However, he chose the last and should be punished for it. The prosecution demanded 10 years in prison for the defendant, but the judge disagreed. Joel was sentenced to six years in prison, followed by indefinite imprisonment in a psychiatric hospital. The court went on to explain that it rejected the prosecution's arguments for 10 years in prison because of the suspect's relatively young age and his extreme diminished capacity when he took the victim's life. Joel, therefore, could not be fully blamed. Upon sentencing, 
sentencing, the court also released a statement. It explained that considering the severity and unpredictability of the crime, along with the serious psychological disorders of the suspect, they believed that a reoccurrence of a violent crime was highly likely. They said that these issues can't be fixed in prison. The court also ordered Joel to pay €68,700 in compensation to Sarah's family. Sarah's mother was understandably furious at the sentence, saying, This is not justice. She was expecting a minimum of 10 years. Instead, after just four years, Joel could be released from prison on parole, although he will then be under close psychiatric care. In America, Joel would have faced life imprisonment or maybe even capital punishment so that he would never have had the opportunity to do something like this again. Isabella Rodriguez was born in 1975 in Colombia. Her parents, Eduardo and Elizabeth Rodriguez, wanted a better life for her and her sister. They moved the family to Florida in the 1990s, where they eventually obtained residency. They couldn't have asked for a better life growing up in the Sunshine State, and Isabella and sister Adriana thrived. Isabella got her US citizenship when she was 27 years old and got married to William Hellman. The couple eventually divorced after 10 years together, but they stayed amicable. Isabella wasn't the kind to hold a grudge, in fact, she didn't have a bad word to say about anyone. She was a kind soul, one that just wanted her happily ever after. In 2015, it seemed like her dreams came true. She met Lewis Bennett online, a once sailor who now owned a small solar panel company. He had moved to Australia from the UK with his family at a young age, and after coming in some family money, he bought a boat, a catamaran to be precise. Soon their internet communication turned into a romantic relationship in real life. He flew her to meet him with his catamaran at various ports. These included Tahiti and Singapore. The two got serious quickly and by July 2016, Lewis and Isabella had a daughter named Amelia. Six months after the baby was born, the couple purchased an apartment in Delray Beach, a city on Florida's Atlantic coast. Things were falling into place for the family of three. On April 30th, 2017, after leaving her nine-month-old daughter with her relatives, Isabella and Lewis went to St. Martin, a small Caribbean island. They'd planned the trip of a lifetime as their honeymoon, heading for Florida on a catamaran that Lewis had bought before he met Isabella. Over the next fortnight, they sailed through the British Virgin Islands, and then along the coast of Puerto Rico, before heading for Cuba. And this is where they spent most of their holiday. To anyone looking from the outside, they were a happy couple in love, all aboard the boat they'd named Surf Into Summer. It was turning out to be the summer of a lifetime and after two weeks on the sea, the pair set sail for home. At about 5.30pm on May the 14th, the catamaran departed from the Cuban resort of Varadero. Three hours later, Isabella called her sister on her cell phone. She told her how she would be home the next day. She was excited to see her baby girl and ready to get home. Shortly after she'd called her sister, Lewis had Isabella take over control of the vessel. They took turns on the night watch and Isabella was up this evening. This was the final leg of the trip, one that Isabella was happy to keep watch for. But Surf Into Summer never made it home, and neither did Isabella Hellman. In the early morning hours, Lewis was awoken by a loud noise while the vessel was on the high seas. He climbed to the exterior of the boat and observed that the sails and rigging were loose. The helm of the vessel was unmanned, and his wife was nowhere to be seen. The boat was sinking quickly, 
So he quickly loaded a life raft with a suitcase, two duffel bags, a backpack, water, some rescue flares, a radio transmitter, boys, food and silver coins. At 1am, Lewis signalled a distress call from the life raft. He contacted the US Coast Guard in desperation. He was 26 nautical miles west of Kaysal Bank in the Bahamas, upon the high seas and in international waters. He was alone, his ship was sinking. There had been some kind of collision, and worst of all, his wife was still missing. At around 4am, a Coast Guard helicopter crew finally located the life raft. Lewis was safe and uninjured but was sick with worry for his missing wife. Rescue swimmers managed to recover his backpack, which was unusually heavy. This was thanks to the 225 silver coins he grabbed before getting off the catamaran. The catamaran was found at dawn, floating upside down but not yet sunk. Lewis was taken to Key West Island, which is the southernmost part of Florida. This is how Tina Saragaglia told me she's used to seeing her friend Isabella Hellman smiling with her nine-month-old baby in her arms. I saw her before she left and uh, they were going to pick up a boat or something and they have a little baby and they are a nice couple. During his interview with investigators, Lewis said that he and his wife took turns on duty and that it was Isabella's turn at the time of the accident. He was asleep in the stateroom, which is like the bedroom on a boat, but awoke to the fact that the ship seemed to have collided with something. He'd gone up on deck but couldn't see his wife. He began calling out her name but never got a response. His worry that part of the rigging was loose and could have pushed her overboard. He was an experienced sailor and knew this was very possible and potentially very deadly. On May the 15th, the very same day, Isabella Hellman was reported missing. A search and rescue operation was conducted from the water and the air. After four days of searching with no sign of the missing woman, the Coast Guard officially announced the end of the rescue operation. There was nothing more that they could do. Less than 24 hours after the search for Isabella had ended, Lewis Bennett requested a letter from the Coast Guard, stating that his wife was presumed dead. The mother of his child, his wife, his partner. He had seen her less than five days before, and yet he was so quick to give up hope. Authorities put his strange behaviour down to overwhelming grief, but it still struck them as rather strange. Lewis's request was denied simply because it was not within the Coast Guard's power to issue such a certificate. On May the 24th, Lewis told a television station that he was leaving for Cuba. There, he planned to rent a boat and continue the search for his wife on his own. Apparently now, he wasn't ready to give up on her just yet. Three days later, he met Isabella's sister. He told her that he had just returned from Cuba. He said, I met the authorities there and checked every hospital, but there is no sign of her. It is now two weeks since she has been missing, so I am not holding out much hope of seeing her. The next day on May the 28th, Lewis came to the house where his wife's family lived to pick up their daughter, but Isabella's family did not want to give her up. Things turned sour and during the disagreement, Isabella's sister repeatedly claimed that Lewis was to blame for Isabella's death. Your sister was dead? Yeah, he killed my sister. How did your sister, how did your sister die? Yeah, he killed my sister. How do you have to see the news? No, how did your sister die? She, she disappeared. She disappeared. Look at the news. He's being investigated. Oh, she's the one from Bahamas? Yeah. Look what you're doing. Yeah. Give me her stuff. Kill my sister. We already know. We already know. You're getting in this. No, 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 no,
With the help of the police, Bennett was able to take his daughter, but this event did raise eyebrows. His quiet demeanour and strange behaviour after his wife's disappearance was rousing suspicion not only from Isabella's family, but also from the police. On May the 30th, Bennett was called in for an interview with the police. During this interview, he denied all allegations of involvement in his wife's disappearance. According to him, he and Isabella had planned a beautiful life together. They were a picture-perfect family. Isabella was his future and he looked forward to living that with her. But now he was alone and their daughter would grow up without a mother. Police were sceptical. While Lewis painted a picture of a happy family life, those close to Isabella had painted a very different picture. Arguments between Isabella and Lewis had become frequent after the birth of their child. The couple's neighbours also testified to this. The two were always bickering. Isabella shared with loved ones that Lewis insisted on moving to Australia, while Isabella didn't want to leave the United States. They couldn't seem to find the happy middle ground, and the honeymoon was supposed to help them do that. As the investigation into Isabella's disappearance continued, police were also looking into Lewis for a seemingly unrelated crime. A year earlier, Bennett had served as a first mate on a yacht. The captain of that yacht had a stash of 617 collectible silver and gold coins worth about $100,000. One day, while the yacht was docked in the Caribbean with no one on board, someone broke in. They didn't steal much only the 617 collectible silver and gold coins. But this case had dried up. Until, that is, a rescue swimmer remembered a weighty backpack. The backpack that was found with the stranded catamaran owner. Inside that backpack was over 200 coins. A year later, the captain of the yacht identified the coins in Lewis Bennett's backpack. He said this was part of his collection that was stolen from him. With this new information, the FBI obtained a search warrant for Bennett's apartment. On June the 16th, 2017, a search of the apartment found 162 gold coins hidden in a closet. But by that time, Lewis had left US territory. He had moved his daughter to England, where his parents lived. Because of this, the authorities couldn't arrest him. That was until he stepped back onto US soil. Lewis's financial situation was not the best, and that forced him to return to the States. Here, he had an apartment to sell and insurance payments to claim for the lost catamaran. On August the 28th, 2017, Lewis Bennett was arrested in Florida. He was charged with theft but maintained his innocence. A couple of days later, a federal judge set Bennett's bail at $250,000. He was unable to pay the quarter of a million bail, so he remained in custody whilst awaiting trial. Whilst waiting, he tried to have his wife declared dead. This would have allowed him to sell their joint property and access the funds in her bank accounts. But twice, the judge refused. The investigation into her disappearance was still ongoing. In November 2017, Bennis pleaded guilty to both stealing the coins and knowingly transporting the coins into the United States. Bennett's parents wrote a letter to the judge in the case. They asked him for leniency in sentencing, giving the reason that his young daughter had already lost her mother. On February the 20th, 2018, Bennett was sentenced to seven months in prison. This was to be followed by another three years of probation. But his troubles were not over by a long shot. Two years after the disappearance of Isabella Hellman, she was finally declared dead. In a series of orders, Palm Beach County Circuit Judge Scott Suskauer wrote that Hellman is presumed to have died on May the 14th, 2017. I quote, To date, Miss Hellman has not been found and has not contacted any of her family. Based on all evidence, Miss Hellman is dead. On the same day that the sentence in the stolen coins case was announced, Lewis Bennett was charged with second-degree murder. Whilst the investigation into the coins was ongoing, 
The police were still intent on finding out what happened to Isabella. The theory was that he had intentionally caused the catamaran in which he and Isabella were travelling in to crash. Investigators argued that Bennett wanted to inherit his wife's fortune. This was in order to pay off his own debts and then to take their young daughter Amelia to live in Australia. A few months before her passing, Isabella confessed through text messages that she was afraid of her husband. Her text messages revealed that she felt Bennett did not respect her anymore and that she found an angry person when she came home. Isabella said that she was afraid to get home. Inspection of the catamaran before it sank showed that the portholes below the waterline were open and the damage to the twin hulls appeared to have been caused from the inside. By examining photos and video the US Coast Guard took from the catamaran before it sank, an expert hired by the FBI to help in the high seas mystery determined that Bennett's original story couldn't actually be true. It does not appear the vessel sinking was caused by accidental damage. Rather, it appears the vessel was intentionally scuttled. An associate professor of nautical architecture and ocean engineering at the US Coast Guard Academy stated in court records. Coast Guard officers who discovered the sinking catamaran also did not find anything that it could have collided with. Divers who were inspecting the vessel were hesitant to go inside. This was because it could have collapsed at any second. And eventually, it did. The catamaran sank to a depth of more than 4,000 feet and no detailed inspection was able to be made. In November 2019, a plea deal resulted in Bennett being charged with manslaughter. Therefore, the second-degree murder charge was dropped. While he could have faced a life sentence for second-degree murder, the deal now gave him a maximum sentence of just eight years in prison. A document signed by Bennett and filed by the prosecutor with the court said he did not remember whether he was looking for or calling for his wife when he discovered that she was missing. He did not fire flares or or search for his wife on a catamaran or in the water. Bennett did not immediately ask for help. Instead, he loaded everything he needed and some valuables into a life raft, and then attempted to stage a collision that caused the catamaran to flood, and then left the vessel on the life raft himself, without his wife. The prosecutor's office stated that yes, he did call for help, but it was 45 minutes after he stopped and realised that his wife was nowhere to be found. Bennett had experience of sailing in open water for extended periods of time. This included being trained in emergency situations. He knew the emergency procedures, but for some reason, on that night, he did not use his knowledge. Was this by choice or was he simply panicking? He did not require Isabella to wear a life jacket, harness or personal locator whilst manning the vessel alone that evening. And I quote from the prosecution, Bennett is an experienced sailor who received a certification from the Royal Yachting Association in the United Kingdom as a coastal skipper. This training included instruction on the emergency procedures, such as man overboard protocols and night sailing safety. But in contrast to Bennett, his wife had not been trained in emergency sailing procedures, did not have a sailing certification, and had substantial less sailing experience. In essence, Bennett admitted to his negligence, namely handing over control of the catamaran to his wife. His wife, who lacked the necessary experience, which ultimately caused her to fall overboard and drown. Only Bennett really knows what happened on that night aboard the catamaran, and he is unlikely to ever reveal it. On May the 28th, 2019, Lewis Bennett, then 42, pleaded guilty to manslaughter for the death of his wife, Isabella Hellman. Under the plea bargain, he waived his right to appeal. Before the judge announced his decision, Bennett asked to be allowed to get out of prison early so that he could continue to raise his daughter. 
daughter. He said, If you may permit me to be with my daughter as soon as possible, I want to bring her up in a manner that is respectful to my wife's wishes. But Judge Marino sided with the prosecutors. He sentenced Lewis to eight years in prison and then three years on supervised release. The Hellman family's attorney said she's lost her mom, but that doesn't mean she's lost her mom's family. Sarah Payne was born on October the 13th, 1991. Her home was Hersham in Surrey. As an eight-year-old girl, she spent her free time playing with her older brothers, Lee and Luke. Occasionally, her younger sister Charlotte would tag along too. Sarah was a loving daughter to her parents, sharing a name with her mother and closely tied to her father, Michael. She was a typical young girl who enjoyed being outside and engaging in playful activities. The four siblings were together all the time. They visited visited their grandparents most weekends to roam the fields near their house. Although they experienced their tiffs, they were a close-knit family that all enjoyed being together. The kids looked out for each other like the best of friends. Hersham is a small quaint village in Surrey. Whilst it's not the most popular place to visit, those that do can enjoy long walks and tranquility. On July the 1st, 2000, Sarah and her family were enjoying another peaceful weekend. They were at Sarah's grandparents' house in Kingston Gorse. This is a beautiful seaside location in West Sussex. Her grandparents had four acres of land. This meant that the kids had free roam to play. All whilst giving Michael and Sarah the security of knowing the kids were safe outside by themselves. Sarah and her siblings were doing their normal activity, playing in the cornfields near the house. It was the perfect place for a classic game of hide and seek. Sarah had been running, trying to get away from the seeker when she fell and hit her head. Her older brother Luke had found her crying, but it's said that he was rather insensitive to the injuries that she had sustained. The two then got into one of their routine tiffs. This resulted in Sarah running away through the fields back towards the grandparents' house. Shortly after, the siblings went to follow Sarah back to the grandparents' house, but they didn't see her walking back. They looked for her far and wide, eventually coming to the road leading towards the home and seeing no sign of her. When Brother Lee arrived at the edge of the field in pursuit of Sarah, he saw a white van driving down the road with an older man in the driver's seat. The man waved at Lee as he passed by. He described the man as scruffy and unkempt, quoting him as being greasy and stuff. When it was abundantly clear that Sarah could not be found, the siblings ran back to the house to alert the adults. And then all hell broke loose for the Payne family. Within hours, a manhunt had been initiated which spanned the entire country. Everyone was on the lookout for Sarah Payne. But where could she possibly have gone? Was she just lost? Had she run away? Was the bang to the head worse than they thought? Or had she been taken? When questioning the family, Lee mentioned the sighting of the old man in the white van. The police were quick to pursue the now very real fact that Sarah had been abducted. Sarah's parents quickly made numerous TV appearances, pleading for the return of their beloved daughter. Let her go. Let her go. Or her if, go. if you know that someone's got an extra child somehow, or, yeah. or, or whatever, you know, get in touch with your local police, you know? Look around you, everybody. Everybody, just look around you. Meanwhile, the police scrambled to track down a mysterious man in the van. The first order of business was to make a list of possible suspects. The kids were away from home, so who would have known that Sarah would have been with her grandparents? Was this all just up to chance? On the other hand, the Payne children went to visit their grandparents frequently, and anyone could have been watching Sarah during her usual frolics in the cornfield. The police very much had their work cut out. 
Kingston Gorse was an extremely safe, wealthy town, somewhere where celebrities and sports players would often go on holiday. It was secluded and quaint and there was only one road in and out. Whoever had taken Sarah had to have previously known about the cornfield where the kids frequented, meaning that it had to be someone who lived in or around Kingston Gorse, someone that was familiar with the area. Because of Sarah's age, there was an obvious way to narrow down the list of locals, the offender registry. Luckily for the investigators, there were only eight people on that list in the Kingston Gulls area. This allowed them to question each person individually. Officer Chris Saunders was one of the detectives who was assigned to go door to door. The first name on his list was a man named Roy Whiting. Whiting had been released from prison two years before, convicted with kidnapping and attacking a preteen girl. He was sentenced to a four-year term in prison. After his release, he was one of the first people in England to be entered onto the offenders registry list. Officer Saunders arrived at Whiting's residence. He rang the doorbell numerous times without response, convinced that Whiting was avoiding him. He decided to call the landline inside the house. Here, Whiting eventually picked up. He finally allowed Officer Saunders inside his home. There, Saunders explained to him that they were investigating the disappearance of an eight-year-old child. Saunders immediately became suspicious of Whiting, not only because of his reluctance to answer the door, but also because of his reaction to the reason Saunders was standing in his home. He basically didn't react at all. When Saunders questioned him about his whereabouts the day before, Whiting answered in, according to Saunders, an automatic and unnatural way. He said that he was in the next town over during the time of Sarah's abduction, and he was in bed sleeping peacefully by 9.30pm. His behaviour during this interview alone catapulted Roy Whiting to the top of the suspect list. He was the main person of interest in this case. Later that evening, Roy would be arrested on that suspicion. To their advantage, the case had received national media attention, with an established tip line for people to call and share information about Sarah's disappearance. This tip line would prove to be extremely useful as Cynthia Reed, an eyewitness, had called to let investigators know that she had seen the white van that Lee had described. She saw this van leaving the scene of Sarah's abduction, fearing that Sarah was most likely inside of it. Police had struck gold once again. Whiting had been bragging about the white van that he had bought just less than a month before. Whiting's confidence in revealing this information had come from the fact that he had taken steps to make cosmetic changes to the van, and he did this in the days following Sarah's abduction. Whiting had purchased new doors. This added windows to the back of the van, changing its appearance. Despite this slight confession, it still wasn't enough to find Roy Whiting guilty of Sarah's abduction, and when the time came, they had to release him from police custody. We're trying to stay as positive as we possibly can, you know? And Sarah, if you're watching, Mommy loves you. And we miss you. And we're looking for you, darling, and we're going to find you. Okay. We're going to find you. And you'll be home. You'll be home, darling. Uh, yeah, I'm still hopeful. We've got to we speak. We've got to keep, try and keep our spirits up in some way. 16 days after Sarah's initial disappearance, this kidnapping case turned into one of murder. Sadly, Sarah's body was discovered by police 18 miles from Kingston Gores, found in a shallow grave just off the roadway. She had been badly attacked, with almost all of her hair being pulled out. The very next day, the tip line would prove its usefulness once again. Someone had discovered a child's shoe at a petrol station. Sarah's mother was able to confirm that it belonged to her daughter. This amount of new evidence was concrete enough to make serious, chargeable connections to Roy Whiting. They got to work to analyse every aspect of both Sarah's body and the shoe. On July the 23rd, Roy Whiting was arrested for stealing a car and then crashing it. This gave the police the perfect avenue for inspecting Roy's notorious white van. 
Upon inspection, police had found a receipt inside the van. The receipt was from the same petrol station where Sarah's shoe had been discovered. The timestamp on it read 10.30pm. But Whiting had said that he was peacefully asleep by 9.30pm. Inside, they also found children's toys, a spade, restraints, baby oil, candy and a child's blanket. Whiting was establishing a pattern. Directly after his previous abduction, he had purchased new doors for his red Ford Sierra to cover his tracks. But now the Littlehampton police were onto him. They had to continue their work on this physical evidence. Due to decomposition, it was difficult for coroners to define what exact injuries Sarah had endured during her abduction and passing. But Sarah's hair and shoe would prove to be the key to what what the police needed for charging Roy Whiting. But at this time, it took months to analyse. Sarah's hair contained fibres from a sweater inside the van, and the sweater also contained hairs that matched Sarah. Contributing to this evidence, fibres from the passenger seats were also found on Sarah's shoe. This evidence is what the police needed to charge the already incarcerated Roy Whiting. You are charged that on Saturday the 1st of July 2000 at Kingston Gorse, West Sussex, you unlawfully took or carried away Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne against her will, and that's contrary to common law. You are also charged that between Saturday the 1st of July 2000 and Monday the 3rd of July 2000 at Kingston Gorse, West Sussex or elsewhere, you murdered Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne he was now on the hook for the abduction and lethal attack of Sarah seven months earlier. Roy Whiting's trial began on November the 14th, 2001. His defence denied his involvement in what had happened to Sarah Payne. Over the next four weeks, the prosecution would attempt to convince the jury of Whiting's guilt, during which they heard from Lee Payne and his account of his interaction with Whiting. He identified him as the unkempt, greasy man that he saw that day. They would also invite more witnesses, like Cynthia Reed, who had seen him driving away. Way, as well as others who had seen his van parked on the side of the road where Sarah was buried. A lot of the evidence was circumstantial, but it was hard to deny the physical connection that Sarah had to that van. But the defence did their best to explain it all away. The defence asserted that there was nothing that could tie Whiting to Sarah. The physical evidence they had was generalised. They said the fibres in her hair could have matched numerous sweaters, and the fibres on the passenger seat could be from any van not specifically Roy Whiting's. They also said that the remainder of the prosecution's evidence was nowhere near concrete, explaining that the restraints found in the van were too large to use on a child, and the receipt for the petrol station wouldn't have been left in an obvious place, not if he knew it would incriminate him. As far as the defence's evidence for Roy's innocence, they presented mud samples from the spade in Roy's van. This sample didn't match the mud at the location where Sarah's body was found. They were pushing the point that there was in fact no connection between him and Sarah Payne. The defence's closing and central argument was that Roy was an open book to the police. He never hid anything, leaving all of his supposed evidence for the police to find with ease. Why would he do these things and testify openly in court if he was guilty. This did prove to be a rather convincing argument. Whiting even admitted in court that he had cleaned his van the day after Sarah's disappearance. This left the decision of the case completely up in the air for both parties. The jury went out to deliberate. Sarah's family waited apprehensively at the possibility that Roy Whiting would walk free. However, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison. Moments after Whiting was taken to the cells, Sarah and Michael Payne faced the world's media. This doesn't make us happy, but justice has been done. Sarah can rest in peace now. But let's make sure that this stops happening time and time again. People are being let out of prison when everybody concerned knows that this is going to happen again.
as Whiting had committed similar crimes before. There was anger amongst the family and general public that this could have been prevented if Whiting was monitored more heavily. Because of this, media outlets throughout Britain stood with Sarah's family. They vowed to reveal the names and locations of similar offenders throughout the country. Sarah's mother rallied and petitioned for stricter monitoring, fighting tooth and nail for change over a number of years. Both parents appeared on television, news interviews and took photo opportunities. And in 2011, 10 years after Sarah's passing, Sarah's law was passed. It allowed parents to formally ask the police whether someone who has access to their child has a record of committing crimes against children. This law has proven to be extremely protective. There were over 1,600 inquiries by parents in the first year. This resulted in hundreds of identified offenders and it could have saved over 200 children from suffering. Shana Grice grew up in Portsdale near Sussex in England. She was the only child to her parents, Sharon and Richard. She was a kind-hearted soul, always going out of her way to help others. After leaving Grove Park School, she moved into a home in Brighton with three friends. Even as a teenager, her friends described her as the mum of the group always making sure that her friends were taken care of. Shana had her life together. She'd been dating Ash, a 20-year-old carpenter, for about three years. They had an on-again, off-again dynamic, but generally it was a healthy relationship. In the summer of 2015, at the age of 18, Shana had got her first real job as a receptionist at Brighton Fire Alarms Company. She'd been excited about the job. It was a real job, and she thought it would look great on her CV. It also allowed her to save money for her dream wedding with Ash. There, she'd met some great friends. To the naked eye, her life was perfect. But behind the scenes, things were less so. While working at Brighton Fire Alarms Company, she met a 26-year-old man named Michael Lane. He was a mechanic at the same company. They started talking and there was an instant connection. They didn't set out for it to be this way, but Shana and Michael entered into a secret relationship, obviously unbeknownst to Ash. It was exciting at first, but Michael quickly began to change. At the beginning of their relationship, he would publicly display affection. This was despite Shana obviously wanting to keep it a secret. He sent her flowers at work and made a big deal out of it, even after she asked him not to. The relationship and Michael's behaviour spiralled quickly. Shana, perhaps with feelings of regret, attempted to end the relationship. Additionally, Michael continuously stalked Shana on a daily basis. Shana was seemingly unprepared for this level of relationship. This started in February of 2016. Shana consistently reported this to the police. In her initial report, she mentioned that Michael had hidden outside of her house, that he slashed her car tyres and keyed Ash's car, leaving a note saying, Dear Ash, Shana will always cheat on you. Happy New Year. The officer who took down the stalking report spoke with the HR manager at Shana's workplace. The HR manager expressed concerns for her safety. The police claimed that there wasn't enough evidence at the time to charge him, giving him only a verbal warning. However, the verbal warning only made it worse. On the evening of March the 24th, 2016, Shana returned home from work with Michael following her closely. Upon arriving home, Shana was on the phone when Michael entered the house. This led to an argument between the two. Michael then chased Shana out of the house. He pulled the phone from her hand and yanked at her hair. The fight was severe enough that a passing car stopped to check if Shana was alright. They picked her up and drove her to Ash's house. The assault was reported to the police. Michael was arrested on suspicion of assault. The very next day, the police arrived at Shana's house. There she was with Ash and his family. They were providing support and comfort after the attack. 
against their own guidelines, a police officer proceeded to interview Shana in front of Ash and his family. During the interview, Shana told the police that she and Michael were only friends, that they were not involved romantically. As we know, this was untrue. But she didn't want to admit in front of Ash and his family exactly what she had been doing. They were completely unaware of the relationship. Everything else that Shana told the police about the assault and the harassment, however, was true. The police then questioned Michael separately. He admitted to having an on-again, off-again relationship with Shana. He confirmed following her, but denied attacking her. To prove their relationship, Michael showed the officer text messages exchanged between the two. The police then later re-questioned Shana. She then admitted to being romantically involved with Michael. She continued to emphasise the stalking and harassment, as well as a physical attack, particularly the hair pulling. But this wasn't enough for the police. They didn't see it as stalking, they saw it as a tiff. In fact, Shana was the one who was punished. For reporting her assault, she was fined and charged with filing a false police report and wasting police time. So despite everything that Michael had done, pulling Shana's hair, stalking her, damaging her property, none of this mattered because they had exchanged affectionate messages. This excuse absolved Michael of any responsibility for his actions, perhaps even empowering him. After this incident, Shana had finally reached a breaking point. She decided to quit her job, citing Michael as the reason. Little did she know this wouldn't be enough to escape Michael. By this point, he had placed a tracker on her car. After Shana received a fine from the police, she felt disheartened and helpless. She stopped reporting incidents out of fear of not being believed. She officially ended things with Michael in July, asking him to collect his belongings and remove them from her house. However, unbeknownst to Shana, Michael stole her house key whilst he was inside. The next morning on July the 9th at around 6am, Shana was still sleeping. Michael entered her home using the stolen key. He went into her bedroom and stood there. He watched her sleep for a minute or two, thinking that she was unaware. But in reality, Shana was wide awake. She was scared and covered her face with her sheets, pretending to be asleep. She lay there terrified, listening to him breathe and say, I wanted to see you, and I knew you wouldn't let me in. I'm just not right in the head, otherwise I wouldn't do it. Shana continued to feign sleep until she heard him leave. After confirming that he had left, she got up and looked out of her window. She saw him walking back to his car. Throughout Shana's reports to the police, they kept telling her that they didn't have sufficient proof of stalking to arrest Michael. But this time, she would be smarter, she would be prepared. Before reporting him for breaking into her house and watching her sleep, she called him to confront him about it and recorded the phone call as evidence. This is that call. Um, so, uh, one question that's really bugging me. Why did you take the key in the first place? Yeah, but that. Okay, I wanted to see you and probably talk to you, and I knew you wouldn't let me in otherwise. Yeah, but that's not good because it's putting us in danger. You could have flipped at any point. What about if? No, I uh, what about if I took? What about if I took someone home or something, and then you came in and saw that I was with someone else? Oh, I just would have left. Well, you, but you left anyway. Yeah, I know I did. But it's just. It's just, oh, yeah, no, it's you, you had no right at all to... Oh, no, I didn't. I oh, know I've got no right or nothing. I know that. Well, I, I still... I, you need to apologise to the girls because it is, it's out of order. Yeah, I know. I just don't want any trouble. Because the last thing I want is to present that. Yeah. Well, just as long... you Just just don't do it again. And I if you come, come near again. the house again... I'd... No, I, won't, I won't come near the house again. I won't contact you again. Okay. I just, I think that, I think that's best because it's just going to keep on going around this vicious circle, isn't it? Shana questioned him and Michael admitted to what he had done. So after the phone call, Shana reported Michael to the police once more. 
she thought that now they were no longer in a relationship, the police would have no excuse to dismiss her. Shana emphasised her fear, highlighting how terrified she was of Michael. As this unfolded, Michael showed up at Shana's house to return the key. However, the police were already there. This led to his arrest. Michael admitted to taking the key, but once again, instead of being charged with stalking, harassment or breaking and entering, he was only charged with theft. Shana was left vulnerable yet again. After this event, Shana and her housemates changed the locks in the house. By July the 10th, Shana went to the police with more reports of harassment. She was receiving a series of multiple phone calls from unknown numbers. When she would answer, there would just be heavy breathing on the other line. She gave the police the numbers that had been calling her, numbers that she didn't recognise. They were able to trace it back to a landline number. Predictably, it was Michael's house. Now, at this time, Shana had started a new job at a grocery store. She hoped that she would be left in peace, able to start afresh. But working a job separate from Michael obviously did not stop him from following her. At this stage, she did start to notice his car, following her very closely behind. She then called the police on July the 12th to report that she was now being followed by Michael to and from work. After this, Michael was labelled as a low risk for harmful behaviour by the police. They sent Shana a letter in the mail telling her that no further action was going to be taken on her case. At this point, Shana knew no one could protect her. We can only imagine how alone she must have felt. She told her family and friends that if they hadn't heard from her in more than a few hours, that something had probably happened to her, and it was probably at Michael's hands. By mid-August, Shana finally agreed to meet up with Michael at a local hotel. There, they spent a few hours together, and apparently they came to the mutual decision that the relationship was officially over, once again, and that Shana was now going to put her full attention on Ash. She left feeling satisfied and thought that maybe, just maybe, all of this was finally over. But Shana was wrong. Michael had called a friend right after this meeting. He expressed that he was depressed after being dumped. He also told the friend that Shana was going to pay for what she had done. After this, Michael sent Shana a formal legal letter. He demanded that she pay him back a debt of £250. This was the money that he had spent on her throughout their relationship. Hmm, big spender. He wanted the money back for all of the dinners, dates, perfumes and other gifts that he had bought for her. However, this debt was never paid off. On the night of August the 24th, 2016, Ash had slept over at Shana's house. He then had to leave for work the next morning. At around 7am, the two had woken up, kissed and then said their goodbyes. They had plans for that evening to meet up after each of them had gotten off of work. However, that morning on August the 25th, Shana didn't make it to her job. This was very out of the ordinary. She was usually very timely and reliable, so about three hours into her shift, her manager called Ash to see if he knew where she was. And right away, Ash knew that something had to be wrong. He immediately called his dad, who was closer to Shana's home. He asked him to go and check on her to see if everything was okay. When Ian got to the house at around 10am, he immediately saw smoke coming from the house and the fire alarms were blaring. When he walked closer, there was a red footprint on the front porch. Then he went over to Shana's bedroom door. He wasn't actually able to open the door because it had been wedged shut with a piece of cardboard. He did finally make it inside of Shana's room, and to his absolute shock and horror, he found Shana lying on the bed, covered in a red substance. She was no longer breathing. The police quickly determined that Shana's life had been ended in her bedroom that morning, and then whoever did it had moved her body to the bed afterwards. They also determined that the fire was most likely purposely started by the perpetrator. They had poured petrol all over her room. The medical examiner determined bad injuries to her neck. There was a deep laceration around 10 centimeters in length. 
the police started interviewing everyone in Shana's life. This included Michael Lane. So at about five, um, sorry, 9.45 yesterday morning, uh, Shana Grice was found dead in her bedroom. Tell me what happened to her. Well, when her body was found, it was clear that someone had assaulted her and they'd tried to set fire to her body. Tell me what you know about what happened to her yesterday. I don't really know what I've been told since being in here. He had a very interesting story to tell. He told the police that he had actually left his house at around 8am that morning to go to work. However, police confronted him with some CCTV footage. This showed him walking nearby to Shana's house at 7.29 that morning. His car was also seen driving in the same area between 7.36 and 8.12am. He then admitted that he was at her house that morning, but he maintained that he had nothing to do with her murder. His story was that he drove his car past her house that morning saying he saw that her car was still in the driveway. He thought this was weird because Shana should have been at work. He said he went into her house and noticed that the front door was half open. He then entered the house and he saw that her bedroom door was also left half open. This is when he saw her body in her room, slumped across the bed, still wearing her nightgown with vital fluids all over her body, the floor and the bed. He also added that he didn't see a fire, and he didn't see any sign of petrol being poured anywhere in the house at that time. But instead of calling 999, he actually left and went to a convenience store to go and buy a lottery ticket. When he was asked by the police why he left and didn't call them, he said that he had just never seen a dead body before. He said that he was scared, that he was in shock, and he just didn't know what to do. He said that he got scared that if he just stood there too long in the house, the police would show up and they would think that he was responsible for the murder. And apparently this is when he noticed that there was blood on his white shoes. And this had gotten there not because he murdered her, but because he had just stumbled upon the body. But by this stage, he started to hear police sirens, so he panicked. But instead of turning himself in or helping the police, he decided to hide his shoes outside on the road. After all this, he then went to the dentist. An unlikely tale and one that the police were already able to disprove. Michael Lane was arrested and charged in connection with Shana's death. On the night before the murder, Michael was caught on CCTV footage buying petrol. Then on the morning of Shana's death, Michael went over to her house and then waited outside. He waited until he saw Ash and her two housemates leave. Once he knew that she was alone, he then entered her house and took a sharp implement from the kitchen. He then dragged it across Shana's neck. He then used the petrol that he had bought the night before and attempted to burn down the house and destroy all of the evidence, which obviously he did not do very well. He took Shana's debit card and walked out of her house. A CCTV camera then picked him up walking towards an ATM. He withdrew £60 from her bank account. Even with this evidence, in March of 2017, Michael entered a plea of not guilty. His defence argued that the two had a consensual relationship, saying that there was no evidence of any violence towards Shana. But the prosecution argued that Michael was obviously obsessed with Shana, and this was proven through his eight months of continuously stalking her. The defence went on to say these complaints of stalking had been exaggerated and blown out of proportion. However, Michael had a very long history of violence, harassment and stalking against other women. In fact, shockingly, there had been a total of 12 other women. They bravely came out to talk about their experiences with Michael. There were women who said that they had dated Michael and that, during their relationships, he was very controlling and manipulative. 
Then there were other women who didn't actually date Michael, but they said he was very persistent and tried to get them to date him. They said that he would send unsolicited explicit pictures of himself to them. There were other women too who said that he would just continuously harass them. That was until they finally agreed to sleep with him. The jury was then shown the video of Michael walking up to the ATM and using Shana's card. The footage showed him trying to withdraw £250, the amount that he felt he was owed. But Shana's account only had £60, so that is all he was able to withdraw. The jury went into deliberation on March the 22nd, 2017. Unlike the police, the jury found Michael Lane guilty. Judge Nicholas Green said to Michael, You have robbed Shauna of her life, and you have caused grief untold to her family and friends. This was a cold-hearted murder. I have not detected in you any appreciation of the devastation that you have caused, nor have I detected remorse. He was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison. Zara Natasha Alina was her mother's only child. Growing up, she loved ballet, tap dancing and skating. Even as a child, she was an extrovert. She could talk for hours, but she was a great listener too. Zara, or Zash to her close friends, knew what she wanted in life from the age of just five. Zara was going to be a lawyer. When she put her mind to something, nothing would stop her. Zara worked hard to earn a law degree from the university of Westminster. She was strong and independent and by the time she was 35 years old, she was a trainee solicitor who had just started at the Royal Courts of Justice. Her dreams were all coming true. She told her friend that she was as happy as she'd ever been and that she could now start thinking of her future and starting a family of her own. Things were falling into a perfect place. On the 25th of June 2022, Zara met a friend for a catch-up. They met at a local pub, The Great Spoon of Ilford. There they had dinner and a drink before moving on to a bar. Here, Zara only drank water, but the two were just enjoying each other's company. At around 2am, they called it a night. The friend got in a cab, but Zara decided to walk. She was close to home and it was a warm evening. Ilford is a bustling diverse area in East London. Zara began to head home along Cranbrook Road, a well-lit residential street just 10 minutes walk from her house. Here she arrived at the junction of Cranbrook Road at the same time as a man, in what would be described as a fatal coincidence. The man had also been in the Great Spoon of Ilford earlier in the evening, but he was kicked out after harassing a female bartender. He staggered around the streets of Ilford, following different women. This is the real CCTV of his actions. One woman, noticing he was trailing her, dived into a supermarket to hide. He marched up and down the aisles looking for her before waiting outside. Later, he went into a chicken shop, staring at a female customer. He had his hands down his trousers, and he then followed her too. But she luckily managed to lose him. He then followed a third woman along the street. When she noticed him, he overtook her, pretending to enter a house. But in fact, he was just hiding in a driveway, lying in wait. Fortunately, the woman went into her own house before she reached him. Wandering back to Cranbrook Road, the man spotted a fourth woman. This was Zara Alina. He crossed the road to begin walking closely behind her. He followed her for a while along the well-lit road. He was caught on camera several more times before he took his opportunity to grab her. He pounced on Zara from behind, placing one arm around her neck and a hand over her mouth. She was now just minutes from home. The fact that Cranbrook Road was a busy road, it had traffic flow and residential houses as well as CCTV cameras, this didn't deter the man. He dragged Zara to the ground and into the dark shadows of a driveway. She fought back so hard that she was able to stand back up, but he struck her again repeatedly until she fell unconscious. He removed some of her clothing before forcing himself on her. 
He then kicked and stamped on Zara. CCTV, which captured the full attack, showed him walking away from the scene twice, but returning to viciously stamp on her once again. He used a fence post for balance to maximise the power of his blows. The attack lasted 9 minutes. He then stole her purse, keys, phone, leggings and underwear. What he didn't want to keep was just strewn on the pavement nearby. Zara lay alone for 20 minutes before she was discovered by two passing couples. She was terribly injured and struggling to breathe. Paramedics were called at 2.44am and for over an hour they desperately tried to save her life on that driveway. She was then taken to the Royal London Hospital. Surgeons fought tirelessly throughout the morning, but tragically, her injuries were just too great. Zara Alina's life officially ended at 9.58am. A post-mortem examination revealed that Zara had suffered 46 separate injuries in a 9-minute attack, severe blunt force trauma to her head, deep lacerations to the scalp, bruising to the lips, eyes, nose and jaw, as well as to intimate areas. Her cause of death was traumatic brain injury and prolonged pressure to the neck. The brutality of the attack is almost impossible to imagine, but it was this brutality that caused Zara's killer to leave crucial evidence. Two fingerprints were left on the fence post he had used to balance himself whilst he attacked. However, both prints were only partial, and neither of them were sufficient enough to generate a match from the millions of prints in the fingerprint database. But the police wasted no time. They collected CCTV footage and very quickly worked their way backwards from the attack, piecing together the suspect's movements in the lead-up. Investigators noticed something significant. He was wearing what they described as a prison-issue vest. This was someone who had been in trouble with the law previously and perhaps recently. An image was circulated around local police stations, and one vigilant officer recognised the man from a previous arrest. He was able to provide a name, and therefore the partial prints were compared to the ones they had on file for this potential suspect, and it was a positive match. The man's name was Jordan McSweeney. But it wasn't just CCTV of his movements before the crime that they gathered. They watched him walk back down Cranbrook Road after the attack before making his escape by climbing a wall into nearby Valentine's Park. There he entered a fairground and made his way to a set of caravans towards the back. Valentine's Park skirts Cranbrook Road and at the time there was a carnival or travelling fairground on it. Police made their way there and passed around the picture. The staff recognised McSweeney immediately and pointed towards a caravan. He's in that caravan there, asleep, they told the police. Jordan McSweeney? Okay. Got cuffs on, yeah. Can you stand <coughs> up for us, mate? Just tell him, just tell him. You're under arrest for rape and murder of a female at Cranbrook Road. Right? Okay. I've got, I've got, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just going to search you now, all right? Yeah. Less than 72 hours after Zara drew her final breath, McSweeney was arrested on the 29th of June. Jordan was 29 years old and a career criminal. He had 28 convictions for 69 previous offences, burglary, assaults on police and members of the public, driving offences, shoplifting, criminal damage, racially aggravated harassment, possession of a weapon, theft of a vehicle, a long and varied career. As a child, he took part in bare-knuckle fights for cash, and he was expelled from two schools, one for selling illicit substances to other kids. Much of his childhood was spent in and out of youth offender institutes, and this trend continued into adulthood. Prior to Zara's attack, he had served nine separate prison sentences. Even in prison, he managed to notch up over 100 separate incidents, violence, threatening guards, misogynistic behaviour towards female staff members. He even started a fire in prison and took part in a riot. 
This riot saw one guard requiring emergency treatment for a wound to the head made by a sharp implement. And unsurprisingly, McSweeney also had a history of domestic maltreatment. He had a restraining order placed on him by one ex-partner, and a ferocious attack on another almost left her blinded in one eye, resulting from a kick to the face. Following his arrest, McSweeney was interviewed by police three times. Knowing how to play the system, he refused to answer any questions. He wouldn't even provide his name or information on where he lived. The only time he spoke was to make threats. He told one officer he was going to bite his face off. He showed nothing but disrespect for the situation that he'd found himself in, right up until the point he was formally charged with Zara's murder. He didn't deny that the CCTV images were of him, and he didn't show a shred of remorse. In fact, at one point, he yawned loudly and complained he was bored. His crime had been opportunistic, and he knew it. He should have been in prison on the night of Zara's Zara's murder. Jordan McSweeney had only been released from prison nine days earlier. He'd served part of a sentence for robbery before he was released on license. This was on the condition that he attended regular meetings with his probation officers. Released on June the 17th, he missed an appointment that very same day. And then another on June the 20th. The police weren't informed to arrest him for another four days on June the 24th. Police went to the address that they had on record for him, his mother's house. This was on June the 25th, but he wasn't there. This was the morning before the murder. An internal review later revealed that a series of errors and miscommunication meant that, despite his long history of violence, he'd been incorrectly labelled as a medium risk to society. He had no tag, and there was what has been described as no clarity whatsoever on where he'd been living. The evidence against McSweeney was overwhelming. Already the CCTV footage and the fingerprints placed him at the scene. But there was more. Police obtained footage from the fairground. This was captured the afternoon following the attack. McSweeney is seen wearing the same prison issue vest and carrying a bag. He reappears just minutes later, shirtless and bagless. The bag was found hidden beneath the skirting of another caravan inside the park. Inside was the vest and his shoes, covered in Zara's DNA. He initially tried to blame all the DNA evidence on having been bitten by a dog. The weight of all this evidence against him gave him no alternative but to lie. McSweeney then pleaded guilty on all charges on November the 16th. Despite this, he still wasn't ready to face up to what he had done. When it came to his sentencing on December the 14th, he refused to leave his cell. The court saw this act as one final act of sheer disregard for Zara's life. At sentencing, the judge said, After satisfying his lust, he proceeded to destroy the woman he had just degraded. With sickening deliberation, he stamped on her. The defendant had the physical advantages of strength and surprise. In everything else, she was better than him. She was talented, spirited, intelligent and kind. The defendant is a pugnacious and deeply violent man, with a propensity for violence. I have no doubt Jordan McSweeney intended to kill Zara Alina. The nature of his attack, stomping on her head, and the fact he returned twice drives me to the conclusion that this was a determined intention to kill. Jordan McSweeney was sentenced to life imprisonment. He will serve 38 years as the minimum term. Given his previous track record in prison, it's likely he will never see freedom again. Hannah Cornelius was born on February the 12th, 1996 in Cape Town, South Africa. Born to Willem, a magistrate, and Anna, a lawyer, she grew up in a stable and happy family. She was kind, intelligent, and very hard-working. 
In the summer of 2015, Hannah started her bachelor's degree at Stellenbosch University. She loved her studies and quickly adapted to university life. She lived at the Irene Ladies' Resident in Stellenbosch, which was nearby. In her spare time, she volunteered at the Tears Animal Sanctuary in Cape Town. She was also very sociable and made friends easily whilst at university. Her willingness to help others out and her happy personality made it easy for her to connect with other people. In her second year at university, she met Cheslin Marsh, a fellow student studying theology. They quickly became close friends, but no one could have anticipated what they would go on to endure together. On Friday the 26th of May 2017, Hannah and Cheslin were out for drinks with friends. They were in their second year of university, and after a long week of studying and working hard, they were blowing off some steam. As the evening drew to a close, Cheslin offered to walk Hannah back to her residence. Stellenbosch, located just east of Cape Town, is a university town surrounded by hundreds of vineyards, many of which play parts in South Africa's famous wine industry. The oak-shaded streets are lined with boutique cafes and galleries, but these shaded streets are also dangerous streets for a girl walking alone. Hannah gratefully accepted his offer of company and they made it back to her residence without any trouble. However, Hannah, as caring as she was, was concerned about Cheslin getting home safely. Despite his insistence that he would be fine riding his longboard home, Hannah offered to drive him back in her car, which was parked just around the corner. Hannah drove an old blue and white Volkswagen City Golf, a car that her 90-year-old grandmother had gifted to her. She loved driving anyway, and it would take her no time at all to drop him off. Cheslin eventually accepted her offer, and the two drove off towards his home. At around 3.23am on the Saturday morning, Hannah parked her car on a small patch of grass while she and Cheslin said their goodbyes. She wasn't parked up for long, not long enough to notice the four men walking by their car along the road. They didn't notice the group the first time they passed by the car. They also didn't notice them as they approached the car for a second time. Using a nearby truck for cover, the four men pounced. In just a split second, the passenger door was ripped open. A sharpened screwdriver and a flip knife were pressed against both their necks. The situation became very serious and very real very fast and the four men forced themselves into the vehicle. Before they could do anything to stop it, Hannah and Cheslin were both real-time victims of a carjacking. After a search to find and claim control of the car keys, one of the four men, 29-year-old Nashville Julius, left. Unfortunately, this wasn't a sign of mercy. Everyone else stayed. Inside the car, Hannah was forced to sit in between the two front seats. She was flanked by two unknown assailants. Cheslin was being pinned by the third in the back. Just 17 minutes after they had pulled up, at 3.40am, Hannah's Volkswagen Golf drove away. Neither Cheslin nor Hannah knew the night that they were in for. Sadly, this was just the beginning. Hannah's vehicle then wasn't seen for around an hour, but at 4.34am it was spotted by a surveillance camera at a petrol station, a station located just outside of Stellenbosch. Somewhere along the dusty road out of town, the men had stopped the vehicle and forced Cheslin into the boot of the car. They frisked him for everything that he had, including his jacket and shoes. As the car arrived at the petrol station, a figure in a cream-coloured jacket can be seen in the passenger seat, and a surveillance camera inside the station captures Vernon Whitbuey entering the shop with a wallet. The wallet belonged to Cheslin. With Cheslin's bank card and pin at the ready, he was ready to rinse it. Unfortunately, after multiple attempts to access his bank account, it appeared as though Cheslin had lied about the pin number, an action he would later pay for dearly. After re-entering the vehicle, the five of them continued their journey to Cryfontaine. This is a neighbouring town to Stellenbosch. 
During this entire horrific car ride, with Cheslin still in the boot, Hannah remained in the front of her grandmother's car, surrounded on all sides by three unknown and dangerous men. She was compliant and cooperative, not looking around, arguing or fighting. Instead, she stared straight ahead into the dark road. Hannah did everything right. The men made several trips around the local area, stopping in frequently to visit various people. These were most likely illicit substance pickups and drop-offs. During this time, Cheslin was still in the boot, trying to kick the door open whenever he thought the men weren't around. But his attempts were fruitless. He was trapped and helpless. That was until 5.30am when suddenly the men stopped the car just outside of Cryfontaine. Hannah asked the men what they were stopping for and they told her they were just going for a smoke break. They told her they would be on their way soon and would return her car when they got to their final destination. It was at that moment that two of the men got out of the car, went around the back and removed Cheslin from the trunk. This wasn't a smoke break. They were clearly mad that he hadn't given them the correct pin number. This was revenge. Cheslin was pushed, shoved and screamed at and found himself lying on the dusty ground, three men standing over him with bricks in their hands. Cheslin knew this was the end. As the morning sun began to climb over the horizon, horrors of the night were still in full momentum for Hannah, and unfortunately, it would only get worse. Driving not far from where the men left Cheslin, the group then travelled to an unused paintball course along Bottle Ray Road. Here, Hannah was assaulted and violated by all three men, though this wasn't the end of her ordeal. Sadly, things would get a lot worse. Next, they drove the stolen car and the terrified 21-year-old to a vineyard. As daylight flooded the farms and savannas of South Africa, a young couple had awoken to a fresh spring weekend. Living in their quaint home along the outskirts of Cryfontaine, the sounds of birds travelled throughout the air. But alongside these familiar peaceful sounds, a distant groaning slowly began to cut through. That groaning soon turned into desperate screams. Peering outside of their window, the couple spotted a young man. He was dazed, confused and covered in a red substance. Remarkably, it was Cheslin. Despite taking several bricks to the head and permanently losing the hearing in one ear, he was alive and his mind was as clear as anything. With his friend nowhere to be found, he knew he needed to seek help. He had stumbled down the road to find the closest sign of humanity that he could find, and luckily he found a couple willing to help. Within minutes, Cheslin was pleading with local police to help find Hannah. He described the faces of the four men. He described the car, all of the locations visited that night, anything else he could remember from the nights before. He desperately wanted to help find his friend Hannah, but tragically, it was already too late. Just two hours earlier, whilst he was still unconscious, Hannah had already been found. She was already gone. Police went out in a relentless search to find Cheslin and Hannah's abductors. They didn't need to look very hard. The men had continued on their crime spree. That morning, they had reportedly chased down a woman on her way to work, before robbing her of her bag and her cell phone. At 1pm that very same day, they attacked yet another woman, this time kidnapping her. Surveillance cameras captured the car at a nearby Shell petrol station. The CCTV shows the blue Volkswagen pulling into the gas station. The same man that tried to use Cheslin's bank cards exited the car. He made his way to an ATM and attempted to withdraw money from the woman's account. This time, he was successfully able to withdraw 3,000 rand. They rewarded the victim's cooperation by abandoning her on a rural road. They then dropped off one of the assailants at his home, with only two continuing to drive around into the late evening. These two men were Vernon Whitbuey and Geraldo Parsons. Little did they know that the police had already been alerted to their movements throughout that day, and now they were closing in. 
Just one hour later, an undercover police vehicle spotted the missing car driving by. And as the pursuit began, a second police van joined in on the chase. Desperately trying to evade law enforcement, the men inside the blue Volkswagen Golf pulled into the driveway of a nearby private farm. The two men made a run for it, one sprinting and jumping into the river below, but this was ultimately in vain. They got themselves trapped and could not escape from the officers. Many of them were now hot on their tail, armed and ready to fire. Their sick and twisted game was now finally over. Following the arrest, both Whitbury and Geraldo were more than happy to name the other two men behind the terrible crimes. This led to two more arrests the very next day. Nashville Julius, Geraldo Parsons, Eben Van Niekirk, Vernon Whitbury. These were the four men responsible for 11 hours of terror endured by Cheslin and Hannah. In May of 2018, the court proceedings would finally begin against the men who took the life of Hannah and attempted to take the life of Cheslin. The evidence against them was solid. They had testimonies, confessions from both Vernon and Geraldo, surveillance footage, forensic evidence and most importantly, Cheslin who took the stand during court. He explained, they were taking me into the bushes, and then they told me I should lay my head on a piece of brick. That's when I realised these people are going to take my life away. And as I was laying on the brick, I closed my eyes and prayed and asked the Lord for forgiveness for whatever I did in this life. They didn't expect Cheslin to survive, they left him there for dead. Geraldo Parsons took to the stand and explained that they didn't intend to then kill Hannah. He alleges that a terrified 21-year-old offered to have intimate relations with the men, if in return they wouldn't take her life. They then took it in turns to violate her. They then put her in the boot of her own car and drove her to a nearby vineyard. Parsons told the court she didn't want to climb out of the boot. She was holding on to the car. She started panicking. Eben came up and jabbed her. I let her go as the blood started to spill. Then I saw Vernon arrive with a rock. I told Vernon, don't kill her, we've already killed Cheslin, let's leave her. But Vernon threw the rock on Hannah's head. This rock was 42 kilograms, around 92 pounds. The impact would have been so great that the injuries would have been immediate and final. Although this case was clearly stacked against these four men, only two of them would confess. In fact, all four of them pled not guilty to their crimes. Throughout these court appearances, it appeared as if these men had very little remorse for their actions. They even smiled and laughed throughout the trial. But ultimately, Vernon Whitbury, Geraldo Parsons, Eben Van Nykirk and Nashville Julius were sentenced to life in prison and Julius was sentenced to 22 years for aiding and abetting. Libby Squire was born on the 1st of January 1998. She grew up in a small village in Buckinghamshire in England. She was a doting big sister to her brother and two sisters, and she was very close to her mother Lisa and father Russell. The small town girl was wickedly funny, witty and known for her kind nature. She had always been intelligent and pushed herself hard to do well in school, but she also held herself to an impossibly high standard. Her mental health soon started to suffer, and before she knew what was happening, she was battling an eating disorder, and then her grades started slipping too. However, she continued to push through and persevere to get her A-levels. She then took a gap year and went travelling in Paris. By the time she got back, she was more than ready to move into the next phase of her life, university. Her mother Lisa was worried about her daughter being so far away. She did not want her mental health to start suffering again, but Libby knew she was ready for a fresh start at the University of Hull. She was going to study philosophy and was in a great place. Libby was ready for her real life to begin. 
on January the 31st, 2019. Libby, now 21, and her friends were getting ready to paint the town red. They were halfway through their second year at university, and they were celebrating their results from their Christmas assessments. At around 8.30pm, Libby left her student accommodation on Wellesley Avenue. She headed with a large group of friends to another student house nearby. A lot of students in the area were going out, and the plan was to pre-drink, play some games, catch up, and then head to the Welly. The Welly was the go-to spot for students in Hull and this night was no different. At around 10pm, she sent her boyfriend Connor a text message. She said goodnight as they were heading out and she was leaving her phone at home. By this point, the pre-drinks were flowing and everyone was in high spirits. The group reached the welly at around 11.20pm, but not everyone made it inside. Libby was drunk. She was actually so drunk that she was struggling to walk, talk or stand. The security team on the door turned her away, saying she had already had too much to drink. Ten minutes later, her friends put her into a taxi, gave the driver money and told him to take her back home. They watched as a taxi drove off, knowing their friend was much safer calling it a night before she put herself in danger. Little did they know that this was only the start of Libby Squire's night. Just before 3am, Libby's friends were winding down for the night. After making it home, one of them sent a text message to Libby's housemate to see how she was. They expected to hear that she was hugging the toilet or passed out in bed, but to their alarm, they said Libby had not come home. They hadn't seen or heard from her since she left in a taxi that night. Was she not with you? The housemate asked. Panic started to set in as Libby's friends started to phone around. No one had heard from her. Panic turned to terror when they found her house keys in the garden. Not only was Libby very drunk, it was also bitterly cold outside and snow was covering parts of the road. They knew this just wasn't safe. The police were called and were concerned. They launched an investigation immediately. With Libby's history of mental health issues, they wondered whether this was a cry for help. Her friends and family knew they had to consider every possibility, but this one was highly unlikely. She had been in the best of spirits, she loved her housemates, and had just received great marks and feedback from her exams over Christmas. Within just a few hours, the media was running with the story. Libby was pushed to the forefront of everybody's minds. The police were able to quickly track down the taxi driver that took her home. The driver claimed that he had dropped her at Wellesley Avenue, and when he glanced back, he saw her walking towards her front door. We know now that Libby never went inside, and fortunately CCTV covered the streets. It wasn't hard to track her movements after getting out of the taxi. She was just a stone's throw from her front door. Cameras showed Libby walking along the roadside at 11.37pm. She was visibly intoxicated. By 11.40pm, she was lying in the snow. Two passers-by stopped to try and help her. They were concerned about the crying young woman laying on the ground. They described her as agitated, incoherent, and when she snapped at the pair that she didn't want any help, they felt that there was nothing that they could do. A group of students then saw her outside their house. They invited her in to check that she was okay, but she instead carried on walking, seemingly aimlessly. An authority said that given how cold it was early that morning, she could well have been suffering from the early side effects of hypothermia. Libby's best friend Lauren said, When people go out and they drink, sometimes you lose your phone, or you can't get home quite as easily. But she's always, always made sure that she's found a phone, or anyone she can contact to make sure someone knows that she's safe, regardless of what had happened. So to not hear anything from her at all is completely not like her. However, Libby was then spotted on CCTV 45 minutes later at the junction with Hayworth Street. A male driver reportedly saw her sitting on a bench and got out to ask if she was okay. She said she was, and he drove away. What happened next remained a mystery. 
In the days following Libby's disappearance, police said that they were still treating it as a missing persons inquiry. Behind the scenes, detectives began looking at it as an abduction. Police asked residents to check their gardens, sheds and outbuildings. This was just in case she may have taken shelter there. Door-to-door inquiries were being carried out and bins and drains were being searched. On the road where Libby lived, the search effort was just as thorough. Police officers were hoping to find even the smallest clue to piece together her last known movements. Just as they were beginning to lose hope, police received their first big tip. A resident that lived near Oak Road Plainfields said he heard a woman screaming at around quarter past midnight. He said that the noise he heard was coming from around the wooded area. It was so loud that it woke him up and he knew the time was exact because he had checked his phone. He looked out of his window to see a man hurrying towards a car. Using this time frame, police went back and searched through the cameras again, but this time working in reverse order. This narrowed down the search. On the footage, they noticed a silver Vauxhall Astra had been circulating the area for hours before Libby was last seen. It was just driving around and around, seemingly aimless. But just before midnight, this car was seen pulling in at the end of the road, close to where Libby was walking. A person stepped out and crossed the road quickly to follow her. The person then crossed back over and started walking along the other side of the road. It appeared that whoever it was had crossed the road to see who, if anyone, Libby was walking with and gauge what the situation was. They stopped for a minute before crossing back over the road and talking to Libby. Five minutes passed when the pair were seen walking together, but now in the opposite direction that Libby had been heading in. Libby was on the pavement and the driver was sitting in the car. Authorities saw a few more headlights come and go, but they believed whoever the driver was was waiting for the coast to be clear before continuing on. At 12.08am, Libby got inside of whoever's vehicle it was and the car drove off. Her watch was later found in that exact area. The police theorised that there was likely a point where either the driver physically tried to coax her in, or maybe even grabbed her arm to pull her into the car. They now had a description of the car, and going off of what the resident had said, a time frame and a potential location for where the car had ended up with Libby. Sure enough, the car was tracked as it pulled into the Oak Road's playing fields. Ten minutes passed and this was around the time the residents heard the screams. The car lights then came back on and the car exited the fields and headed back out onto the streets. Two women then also came forward with a separate complaint. A complaint that would ultimately turn into a huge lead. They reported that at around 3am, a a man had stepped out in front of them on the streets and then started intimately touching himself. They were horrified, but he didn't seem bothered at all, relishing just how uncomfortable he had made them. Using this time, location and description, they found the man in question. Everything matched up and it was the same man in the same car. They now had a clear image of their person of interest. Following his movements in the hours before and days afterwards, they got a hit on the car's number plate. On February the 6th, the police arrested a 24-year-old man in connection with Libby's disappearance. The man was a married father of two. His name, Pavel Relevich. He worked as a butcher and moved to the UK from Poland as a teenager. Neighbours described Pavel as a hard-working man who enjoyed the gym, baking and long walks with his young family. He was always friendly, polite and smiling. However, little did anyone know that Pavel would soon rack up a string of crimes. The police had caught a very dangerous individual. Along with being arrested for the suspicion of Libby's abduction, he was also arrested for several offences. Pavel lived close to where Libby was last seen, and to the fields where the screams had come from. After taking a sample of his DNA, it turned out that he was linked to several other crimes, going back almost two years. 
For a long time, Pavel had been breaking into people's homes, peering through windows and following women on the streets. Although fingerprints were often lifted and DNA samples were taken from the houses, Pavel had no criminal record and a match to him was never made. But now they had their man. The police conducted a thorough search of his house and vehicle. Whilst his house turned up nothing, inside his vehicle was a different story. There was dirty underwear, adult toys, used prophylactics, photographs of women clearly taken without their permission, along with various other items that had been stolen from houses. When he was asked about Libby, he denied ever seeing her in his life. But when a CCTV was shown to him, he changed his story, saying he had picked her up that night to help her, calling himself a good Samaritan and offering to take her home. He said he drove her to Oak Fields and then drove off. This wasn't an admission of a crime, but it was enough to place him at the scene. But unfortunately, this still wasn't enough to charge him. The case had come to to a standstill. Seven weeks after Libby had gone missing, a fisherman in the Humber estuary found a badly decomposing body floating on the water. Around the neck was a little necklace with the letter L on it. It was Libby. Her condition was so bad that it was not possible to determine the cause of death. It was unconfirmed whether she was already dead when she went into the water or not. The pathologist said that she could have died from asphyxiation or drowning, but they could not be certain. Testing confirmed that Libby had also been violated before being killed. Everyone was devastated. Mother Lisa was even more upset when she found out where Libby had been found. Libby had a huge fear of water and wasn't a strong swimmer. Wondering whether she was alive or not when she went into the river only added to the heartbreak. Police continued to build their case against Pavel. They searched through thousands of hours of footage to solidify his movements on the night that Libby got into his car. CCTV had shown him driving back out to the same location at around 2.30am in the morning, just two hours after he was initially there with Libby. He stayed for a few minutes before heading back into town, which is where he exposed himself to the women on the streets. This was the final piece that they needed. He would have had no reason to go back there unless he was concealing things and covering up evidence. More tests also came back after months of waiting. They showed that Pavel's DNA was on and inside Libby's body. He then changed his story, saying that Libby had essentially thrown herself at him, and the pair had had consensual relations in the field before he left her there. But it was clear that this was not the truth. Detectives finally had enough to charge him. In October 2019, Pavel Relevich was charged with the assault and murder of Libby Squire. As he was read the charges in the police car via a translator, he started to laugh, appearing completely unfazed. I must say that you are under arrest for the murder and rape of Libby Squire in Hull on Friday the 1st of February 2019. Muszę pana poinformować, że zostaje pan oskarżony w tej chwili za zabójstwo i zgwałcenie Libby Squire dnia 1 lutego 2019 roku w Hull. It's impossible. To jest nie może, ja nic nie zrobiłem, to jest stu procent. What I mean is, it, I, I haven't done anything. This is 100% sure I would have never killed a, a human being. He pleaded not guilty, maintaining his story of a casual, consensual hookup. After delays due to the pandemic, the trial finally began in January of 2021. The prosecution put forward a damning case. They argued that Pavel was a highly dangerous predator, someone whose crimes had escalated to the point where he was willing to do anything to fulfil his perversions. They claimed that he saw women as objects and got a thrill out of frightening them. According to the prosecution, from the second he saw Libby that night, alone, cold, up Upset and vulnerable, she simply became his target, his prey. 
They argued that he knew instantly what he was going to do the second she got into his car. They said that if it wasn't Libby, it would have been someone else, sober or intoxicated on that day or another. However, the defence was focused on the less than 10 minute window that he would have had to commit the crime. They argued that his car pulled into the fields at 12.11 and the screams were heard at 12.14 and then he was back out and driving by 12.20. It left a less than 10 minute window for all of this to happen, but the jury felt that this was more more than enough time. After deliberating for five days, the jury found Pavel guilty on both counts of murder and the assault. He was jailed for life with a minimum term of 27 years. Upon sentencing him, the judge said that Libby did not stand a chance that night. They said that Pavel may never be released and if he is, he will be monitored for the rest of his days. Molly McLaren was a 23-year-old student at the University of Kent. Surrounded by friends and family, Molly had a support system that was setting her up for the brightest of futures. She was making amazing grades and gaining significant popularity on social media. All of this was working towards securing her career as a personal trainer and fitness influencer. Although she had struggled as a teenager with an eating disorder and anxiety issues, she had worked hard to overcome them and prioritise her own health, both mentally and physically. Molly desired to be an encouraging influence in the lives of anyone going through what she had once endured. She wanted to reach the lives of people that felt exactly the way that she did, educating them, bringing awareness and providing resources for those struggling with eating disorders. Her friends and family described Molly as a ball of positivity, fun and kindness, spreading an infectious light to everyone she came into contact with. This case takes place in Kent, a popular tourist destination and one of the top 10 wealthiest counties in the UK. Because of its beautiful fields and orchards, Kent is lovingly referred to as the Garden of England. As a student, Molly was active on Tinder probably the most well-known dating application. Popular among mainly single people, it's a fast and easy way to meet new people. Molly had used the app numerous times before, but had never yielded a relationship that lasted longer than six months. In July of 2016, this trend in Molly's dating life would change. She was swiping left and right on Tinder, until that is, she came across a man named Joshua Stimson, a 25-year-old warehouse worker with striking eyes. They began talking immediately, quickly getting into the intimate details of their own lives. Joshua had shared his own struggles with mental health throughout his life, revealing to Molly that he had bipolar disorder. Molly was able to resonate with Joshua's struggles. She detailed her own issues with anxiety and disordered eating. Molly saw the pain that Joshua had gone through, feeling the pull to support him through his anxieties. After all, her calling in life was to help people who struggled like she did, and the attraction between the two was too difficult to ignore. Molly told Joshua to pretend that they'd been talking for longer than just a few days. She felt like she had known him for a lifetime. After spending months talking non-stop, they finally had their first date in November of that year. By that point, they were already so infatuated with each other that meeting face to face made their passion for each other ignite into flames. Molly introduced Joshua to her parents and her mother was a little apprehensive towards him. The fact that he had bipolar disorder scared her. She didn't want her daughter to be brought back into the dark place that she once was. Nevertheless, she supported Molly in her decision knowing that she was an adult who was capable of a mature relationship. The two couldn't go more than a couple of days without seeing each other. That is, until the honeymoon phase of their relationship came to an end. It was time, at least in part, to go back to reality, and Molly wanted to live her life with Joshua as an important part of it. Unfortunately, Joshua didn't have the same vision of their budding romance. As the weeks went on, Joshua became increasingly more controlling, always wanting to know where Molly was, where she was going and what she was doing. He was now obsessed. He would ask to come over and see her every single day. 
He even quit his job at the warehouse to spend as much time as he could around his beloved. Even when Molly was busy with homework and told Joshua that she couldn't see him, he would come over anyway, leaving Molly frustrated with where their relationship was headed. She had finally escaped the control that her mental health and eating disorder had over her life, all to be controlled once again, but this time by a man. On the other hand, Molly knew that Joshua's mental state was fragile. She couldn't bring herself to end things with him despite the turbulence that she was feeling inside. By April of 2017, the relationship had taken a huge downturn. Molly had found out that Joshua was taking photos and videos of her without her knowledge. This left her feeling violated and completely out of control of her own body. She didn't know what to do anymore. She asked her mum for advice. Her mother later recalled the situation, saying that Joshua remained cool as a cucumber during the whole ordeal. He felt no remorse for taking these photos and videos, and he didn't even believe that he did anything wrong in the first place. By June of 2017, Molly was exhausted. She couldn't take any more of the countless arguments, lack of trust and insecurities on the part of Joshua. This was supposed to be a relationship and it was turning more into a prison sentence. She finally broke the news at a belated birthday celebration. She told Joshua that they could no longer be together. He didn't take it well at all. He cried and screamed turning the heads of Molly's friends in the middle of a birthday party. Despite the messiness of it all, Molly was relieved to be rid of the man that was watching her every move. But unfortunately, and predictably, it didn't stop there. It was only a matter of time before the photos and videos that Joshua had taken of Molly were weaponized against her. He took to social media to post the content that he had taken of her, labelling her as an illicit substance user and as an all-round awful person. It was devastating that it had come to this, but with the support of her family, Molly knew what she had to do. She gathered all the posts that Joshua had made about her and brought them to the Kent police. The tactic and response of the Kent police was to scare Joshua into leaving Molly alone. They called him on speaker and attempted to intimidate him, asking, We wouldn't want Molly to come to the police station again about you, would we? The alarming response they heard from Joshua through the loudspeaker was, Wouldn't we? Joshua aggressively asserted that he had done nothing wrong, saying that if what he was doing was wrong, they could be assured that there was more to come. Fortunately, the police called later and told Molly and her family that Joshua had agreed to take the posts down. He was afraid about what the bosses at his new job would think about his social media slander campaign. Molly felt that she could relax, hoping that the nightmare was finally over. Trying to get back into her regular routine, she visited the Ship and Trades pub with some friends. It was a night to celebrate her enrolment into a personal training course. But to Molly and her friend's surprise, a familiar face walked through the door with a girl on his arm, none other than Joshua Stimson. He had walked by Molly and her girlfriends with his new date, with Molly rolling her eyes and calling him a creep. The group pondered how Joshua would even know that they were at a pub in the first place, but they quickly realised that they had posted about it on social media just hours before. Was Joshua stalking Molly? Molly's friends recalled seeing him walk by without his date, and seeing him standing in the smoking area to watch them. But Joshua didn't even smoke. The group was able to leave safely and without issue, and Molly shook off the otherwise unsettling situation. Situation. Sometimes breakups are just messy and people can be immature. On the morning of June the 29th, Molly continued to try and return to her normal single life. She arrived at her local gym at 10am, ready to begin her day with a workout. It wasn't long before Joshua was caught on CCTV footage following her into the facility, walking to work out next to her in the otherwise empty room. Molly immediately texted her mother, letting her know that Joshua had shown up to the gym and that she was there alone with him. 
Molly's mother responded by calling her in urgency, telling her to leave the gym without looking back. As Molly packed her stuff and briskly walked to her car, she sent a text to her friends relaying this same information, complaining about how she felt she always now had to look over her shoulder. But this would sadly be the last text that Molly would send. The Kent police arrived at the plaza where the gym was situated, and what they found was like a scene from a horror movie. Numerous bystanders had witnessed a vicious attack on Molly, her driver's side door being ripped open, and her body being inflicted with 75 wounds made by a sharp implement. Benjamin Morton was the man that had called the police, valiantly attempting to stop the attacker and block him from leaving the scene. He had slammed the attacker's leg in the car door and he attempted to pull him away from Molly, but the assailant's fit of rage would not be interrupted. When the police surveyed the scene, the attacker strangely approached them almost immediately. Wiping the red spatter from his face, he calmly looked at the officers and said, You want me. To the officer's horror, the assailant was a subject of their phone call earlier that month. It was, of course, Joshua Stimson. Hero Morton had tried to revive Molly from the gruesome attack, but it was without success. Molly's life was pronounced to have officially ended at 11.43am, the cause of which being trauma to the neck. The arrest and interrogation of Joshua required little effort on the part of the police. Joshua had admitted to the acts that he had committed, saying that although he ended Molly's life, it was not premeditated. According to Joshua, he had been so overtaken with rejection that he had to end his pain in the only way that he knew how, by taking revenge and taking Molly's life. Joshua would stand firm on his statement as his trial began in early 2018. His defence team asserted that Joshua couldn't control the pain of Molly's rejection. This was due to his mental health issues. They claimed that Joshua had been heavily affected by the divorce of his parents and the subsequent abandonment by his mother. He frequently visited mental health clinics throughout his life, attempting to deal with his extreme hypersensitivity to rejection and, according to the defence, a personality disorder. For these reasons, Joshua didn't have the mental capabilities to premeditate his attack on Molly. His acts were outside any type of normal cognitive function. But but for the prosecution, this couldn't be further from the truth. If Joshua's attack wasn't premeditated, then he wouldn't have been seen on CCTV purchasing a sharp implement just days before. This same implement would be used to take Molly's life. Further than this, if Joshua was so overtaken with the pain of rejection, why did he wait weeks to commit this awful deed? Nothing about this assault seemed to result from a lack of control, nor did it seem purely impulsive. However, the defence's assertion about Josh's mental state was still an important thing to consider. Because of this, the prosecution welcomed a psychiatrist who evaluated Joshua to testify to his condition. But according to him, there was no evidence of Joshua having a personality disorder or any mental defect. Instead of that, the psychiatrist did suggest that Joshua had traits of narcissism, having absolutely no remorse for the crimes that he had committed. By the time the closing arguments rolled around, it was unclear which side had the advantage. Molly's mother and family members must have been struck with anxiety. After only three hours of deliberation, the jury had made their choice. Molly's family and friends breathed a sigh of relief. The jury declared that Joshua Stimson was guilty of a premeditated vicious attack on their beloved girl. At his sentencing, Judge Adele Williams had some choice words to say as she committed him to a minimum of 26 years in prison for his crimes. She detailed how Stimson was a highly dangerous man, believing that women would be in danger if he were free to walk the streets. She hoped that he would never be released for the things that he had done to Molly to her family and to her future. 
Molly's family released an official statement thanking the bystanders of the assault for their brave efforts in saving Molly's life. Regarding the proceedings, they said, The verdict has brought us a small measure of comfort, but it seems that nothing will take away the pain, or allow us to come to terms with our Molly being taken away from us. We are serving a lifetime of pain, anguish and loss. A light has gone out in all of our hearts, but shines bright as a star forever glowing. Following the trial, the Molly McLaren Foundation was launched by Molly's family. This is an organisation that would continue the dreams that Molly had for her life that ended too soon. The foundation holds a huge event every year, full of games, food and fun, raising money for and bringing awareness towards charities that seek to reach people who struggle with eating disorders. Since its establishment, they have raised over £30,000, all in support of Molly's goals for positivity, confidence and change, turning the most horrifying events into a beacon of light for the world. Riley Crossman was born on December 22, 2003, in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her mother was Chantelle and her father was named Lance. Her family described Riley as beautiful, an innocent soul with a laugh that would fill a room. She was a natural artist, a talented dancer, and it was said that she had the singing voice of an angel. Riley had a real love for babies and children, and they always seemed to love her too. She was a big sister to one little sister and two younger brothers. Being a big sister was perfect for Riley. Her family said that she was a real beacon of light to them and to the world. She was loving, helpful, caring and kind. When Riley hit her teenage years, her family described her as being intelligent and as dramatic as teenage girls come. I think they meant that in a loving way though. That is the reality of being a teenager. Her parents did split up and this gave Riley two new families, one in Martinsburg and one in Barclay Springs. Mother Chantel paired up with boyfriend Andy McCauley and they lived together. Father Lance found love once more as well with Jessica Bishop. Bishop. By 2019, Riley was now 15 years old and was beginning to transition into the adult world, although she was still very much a fun-loving teenager. She began to date her schoolmate named Hayden. Although a teenage romance, Hayden did seem to genuinely cherish Riley. Riley's parents actually supported the relationship. They could see that Riley was happy with him and they believed she had found a good young man. As her parents were now separated, she did see both parents regularly Regularly, but she spent most time at her mum's. This meant that she went to school there and built a bit more of a life for herself in that home. Whilst she spent time with both of her parents, she mostly stayed at her mother's place and went to school there too. Other than the previously mentioned normal teenage drama, things were looking good and were only looking to get better. On the 7th of May 2019, Riley had been at school all day. She then returned home at around 3.30pm. As she came in through the door, she saw her mother sleeping on the couch. Mother Chantel was a hard-working woman. She normally worked two jobs to keep the family afloat and the house in order. However, on this day, Chantel was feeling under the weather. She left her first job early so that she could try to recover before starting her night job. After resting up, up as best as she could, she got herself together and once more went to work. Once Chantelle had left the house, Riley spent a few hours with her grandmother. As time drew on, they separated ways and Riley went up to her bedroom. Mother Chantelle got back from her second job at about 10pm. She saw that daughter Riley's door was shut. This wasn't particularly unusual. She could have been busy or maybe she had just crashed out early that night. Chantelle then decided to go to bed herself and try to recover from her illness. The house fell into silence. The next morning, now the 8th of May, Mother Chantelle was once more getting ready for work. She noticed that Riley's bedroom door was still closed. This was kind of unusual, but not too disturbing. She decided to just go and check on her daughter but Riley wasn't there. She checked the rest of the house. Still no Riley. 
Riley was known to sometimes leave the house early to go to school. Arriving early meant that she could spend some more time with her friends. And more importantly, it meant that she could see her boyfriend, Hayden. Hayden was actually due to go on a field trip that day. So to Chantel, it all kind of added up. Her daughter had gone to spend time with her boyfriend whilst she could. The entire school day passed without anything new coming to light. But then the time came when Riley should have arrived home. As 3.30pm passed, Riley's grandmother noticed that she hadn't yet made it home. This was concerning enough for her to call Chantel. Mother Chantel was concerned and went about tracking Riley down herself. She tried contacting her daughter by text message, but they weren't going through. She tried to call her, but those calls went straight to voicemail. Concern was growing by the second. She contacted the school to see if Riley was still there or if they knew anything else. However, in a moment that must have made her blood run cold, she was informed that Riley never even made it to school that day. Chantelle sprang into action and drove directly to the school. Her last port of call was her daughter's boyfriend, Hayden. She waited in the school parking lot for him to get back from the field trip. And when he arrived, Chantelle hoped that he would be able to shed some light on where Riley was. But she was sorely disappointed. Hayden had gone the entire day without seeing or even hearing from his beloved girlfriend. Far from finding out where Riley was, Chantelle now almost knew even less than she did before. There was no other place to turn other than to the police. She called the police and reported Riley as officially missing. The police force, Riley's family and volunteers from the community all sprang into action. No stone was left unturned in the local area. Time was of the essence to bring Riley home. The school and surrounding areas were intensely searched. The search team combed the neighbourhoods and parks tirelessly. But Riley just seemed to have vanished. There were theories that perhaps she had run away from home. However, we are talking about a 15 year old here. Riley couldn't drive, she didn't have the finances and it didn't seem like she had the motive to do so either. She was, to all intents and purposes, happy. Things were going well and it didn't seem realistic that she would leave her mother, father, grandmother, siblings, friends or Hayden. Perhaps something more sinister was at play. Police looked at the last time that Riley was confirmed to be okay. Riley's grandmother saw and spoke with her on the night of the 7th. And after that, there was only contact made via her cell phone. Riley spoke to her friends and Hayden until around midnight. So we can deduce that when Mother Chantel got home at 10.30pm that night, Riley was in her room and on her phone. But then after that, there was one more sign from Riley. Strange Strangely, at 5.30am, Riley called Hayden. However, understandably, Hayden was asleep and the call went unanswered. Since that call, nobody had heard from or seen Riley Crossman. Police descended on the Crossman home, hoping to shed more light on what could have happened. You mind if we take a look in her bedroom? This is her straight back? Yes, sir. One mirror we have like this, so I came in yesterday morning, and I don't remember them being there. I feel like I would have noticed her boat bag still being here, and especially her glasses, because I, this is not exactly the way it was. I've been in here digging and looking to see if there was a note. When's the last time you, you saw her? Oh, uh, about nine, maybe ten-ish. At night? Yeah. And, and, what, and what context was that? Oh, uh, she was here at the house. She went to bed probably... Well, I don't know what time she was in bed, but she was, all the kids were in the room by like 9.30, 9, 9.30. Did she ever leave in the morning? No. I left four, I got up four o'clock in the morning. That was five. Police searched the home, much of which was pretty unremarkable. There were no obvious signs that this was a crime scene. Upon entering her room, however, something was obviously not right. Furthering the theory that Riley had not run away on her own accord, on her bedside sat her wallet and her glasses. Why would she run away without these essentials? 
it just didn't make sense. But much darker was reddy brown stains on Riley's bedsheets and pillows. The pillow was tested and it revealed it contained saliva mixed with blood. DNA testing revealed that it belonged to Riley. Police now strongly believed that Riley had been abducted and everyone hoped that she was still alive. The search for Riley went on and the search for her abductor began. On May the 16th, 2019, nine days after Riley was last seen, an update finally came their way. Police received calls of a disturbing scene unfolding near Tuscarora Pike in Berkeley County. A body inside a trash bag was found in a state of decomposition. The clothing pointed towards it being Riley and Mother Chantelle confirmed the clothes were indeed her daughter's. After an autopsy, the worst was confirmed. This was Riley Crossman. However, due to the state that the body was discovered in, police were unable to determine how Riley had met her end, nor could they determine if she had been violated. The fact that Riley was found in a trash bag was just one marker of the crime. She was covered with drywall joiner or some similar white chalky substance. She was wearing just one untied shoe. The other was not at the scene. She wore shorts that were unzipped and unbuttoned. There was the notable absence of a bra and her underwear was ripped. Everything here pointed towards murder. The hunt for Riley's killer was on. Devastation ripped through the family and the community. Everyone was on edge. Who did this and would they do it again? Police spoke once more with Riley's parents and other family members. Even if they weren't guilty themselves, they may have had some much needed information. Everyone they interviewed had watertight alibis. With one exception. In their investigation, police spoke to one neighbour that had some interesting new information. A green truck was seen on the driveway of the Crossman house on the very day that Riley vanished. This truck wasn't known to the neighbour. She knew that Mother Chantelle was at her night job and Chantelle's boyfriend Andy didn't drive. So the driver of the truck was a mystery. If they knew who drove it, they may have the killer. Back on that day that Riley went missing, Chantelle had noticed something a little strange. When she told her boyfriend Andy that Riley seemed to have gone missing, she said he acted strangely. He didn't seem overly concerned. He instead seemed jittery, nervous. He went into a kind of panic mode, but not a helpful one. She saw him quickly entering the house and grabbing some items. He then left, claiming he was going to look for Riley, just as Chantelle was. And later that night, when Chantelle finally made it home after searching for her daughter, she saw Andy pretending to be asleep on the couch. Had he even looked at all? Something felt off. The police spoke with Andy once more. He had some new questions to answer. Andy was taken in for questioning and was asked about where he was on May the 8th. Andy told them that he was at his job just as he should be. But his workmates told a different story. They said that he left for four to five hours in the day, highly suspicious. Andy then took this as a chance to change his story. When was the last time you saw him? 9.30ish. 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, 9.30
They're all trying to. Let's try this again. Let's go back. I know it's been a couple days. I know a lot has happened. Okay, get that. I understand that. He now said that yes, he had left his job. And he did so to go and buy illicit substances from a dealer. And one workmate said that his excuse for leaving was actually to go and meet a girl. His story was in tatters and couldn't stand up to the most gentle probing. Is there a reason in your mind that you would think that she would tell her boyfriend that she's afraid of you? No. Something going on that night and that you'll get into any sort of argument? No. She FaceTimes her boyfriend all the time. You realize that, right? Yeah. What if I told you her last text to her boyfriend? We're saying don't talk because she still has the FaceTime one. And he's in here. I'm afraid. That's what it said. What if I told you that? Obviously, that's crazy. 100%. Obviously, that's crazy. She lives in the same house you're in? Yes. Okay. Besides her boyfriend and mom and her brother, you probably have the most access to it. Right? I guess, if that's what you want to say. The floodgates now opened and a wave of evidence came to light. The green truck that the neighbour saw pull up to the house was identified. It belonged to Andy's workmate. The truck was subsequently searched and revealed some damning finds. The chalky white filler substance that was found on Riley's body was also found in the truck, along with some sheet metal screws. Two of this exact type of screw were also found at the scene that Riley was discovered at. Specialist cadaver dogs also matched a scent from the scene to the truck. CCTV from around the time that Riley went missing also didn't help Andy's case at all. Andy was seen driving the green truck to locations near the crime scene. There was no evidence of him meeting the dealer, as he said. When the locations revealed on the CCTV were cross-referenced with Andy's cell phone location, this just opened up another can of worms. His phone records revealed that he had been contacting workmates to try and secure somewhere to stay. Weirdly, one colleague that he tried it on with didn't even really get along with him. So this presented as odd and desperate. Andy just seemed to desperately want to distance himself from the Crossman household. The picture being painted was extremely dark. In September 2021, over two years since Riley's passing, the case went to trial. Andy was on a hook for first-degree murder, concealment of a body, and crimes against a minor. The prosecution got to work. Along with 239 pieces of evidence and 25 people willing to testify against Andy, this is what they believe happened. On Riley's final night, she was messaging boyfriend Hayden. Hayden recounted how Riley was saying that Andy was in the house. He seemed to be high on illicit substances and he was going in and out of Riley's room. She said that she was scared of him. The prosecution claimed due to his illicit substance usage, his judgement was impaired. He then attempted to violate Riley, smothering her with a pillow as he did so, until she was no longer breathing. After some weak defence and a plea for a 15-year sentence, Andy was found guilty on all charges and was handed down two life sentences, with no chance of parole. 39-year-old Rosemary Theron was a free spirit who thrived in Cape Town, South Africa. She was an entertainer and lover of all things creative, joyfully spending her days plastering smiles on faces through her work as a clown, stilt walker and face painter. Her family members and those that knew her described her as an ethereal beauty, a flower child who loved to make children laugh. She had an amazing and close relationship with both her mother Denise and her sister Angelique. Angelique knew her affectionately as Rosie. She called her a beautiful soul that was one with mother nature. Richard Crack, a close friend of Rosemary, described her as an unconventional and creative person who enjoyed making puppets. One year, she made a life-size horse puppet for the Cape Town Carnival. Rosemary was also the proud mother of two daughters and one son. Eight-year-old Shariel, 18-year-old Phoenix, and 14-year-old Taki. 
Even when she took the time to use social media, Rosemary expressed her love and pride in who her kids were and what they did for her on Facebook. She posted songs they wrote and activities in which they participated. She truly loved life, calling herself Rosemary Lovemore Theron. Everyone in her life knew her as a free loving spirit who, although flawed, always did her best to be light in a dark world. There were, however, long periods of time where Rosemary would seemingly abandon her children, going on trips and living out her nomadic, carefree dreams. However, this life didn't transfer well onto her three children. The children would often be present during wild parties, parties where less than desirable members of society would attend. This was beyond believing that societal norms weren't the way to live. This was a choice that actually endangered her children. Sadly, on at least two occasions, Phoenix suffered violations of an intimate nature at the hands of adult males. Arguably, this was as a direct result of Rosemary's lifestyle choices. Whereas Rosemary may have been living the dream, Phoenix at times was living a nightmare. Cape Town is an extremely popular city and the legislative capital of South Africa. This means it is a place full of life, culture and entertainment that Rosemary Marie loved so dearly, but it also had its problems. It was a seemingly ordinary day on March the 7th, 2013 in Cape Town. Rosemary was going about her day as anything but a normal mum. She had recently sent her son Taki to live in Chile where he could build a relationship with his father. In her son's absence, Rosemary took care of her 8-year-old daughter as well as another young family relative. It was well known what Rosemary's thoughts were on traditional societal conventions, school being one of them. Them. Rosemary did not believe in the value of traditional schooling. She thought that homeschooling was a much better alternative for parents to nurture their children. This meant that both her younger daughter as well as the relative that Rosemary cared for were not enrolled in a traditional school. Rosemary's older daughter, 18-year-old Phoenix, did not hold the same belief as her mother. Phoenix thought that traditional public school was not only acceptable but had a positive impact on children. That it set them up for a successful future. Phoenix wrestled with the fact that her younger family members were not going to school. She talked with her boyfriend at the time, Kyle Maspero, about her concerns with the younger children. This included the fact that they were not going to school. The two decided that it was now time that they discuss their thoughts on the matter with Rosemary. Daughter Phoenix and her boyfriend Kyle confronted Rosemary with their thoughts and concerns about the children's lack of schooling. This started a small argument. Although the two argued back and forth, it wasn't a particularly explosive discussion, but it also wasn't the calmest. Even so, people say things they don't mean in a heated discussion, which is predictably what occurred in this situation. Rosemary criticised Phoenix for not contributing financially to the home, while Kyle criticised Rosemary for her parenting skills. The argument ended with all three parties agreeing to disagree, generally frustrated with the entire conversation. Rosemary left for a work day filled with the things that she loved to do with the hopes of smoothing things over when she returned home. However, Rosemary would never have that opportunity. She strangely went missing. It was common for Rosemary to take spontaneous last minute trips with her friends, so her absence wasn't totally unusual but something wasn't quite right. It was possible that the heated debate that she had with her daughter motivated her to take some time alone, time to clear her head and devise a plan to move forward with her family. She did actually trust Phoenix to take care of the young children that lived in the house and most thought that this situation was no different, and that she'd left her daughter once again to take care of things. However, things would soon escalate. Rosemary failed to turn up for her daughter's ninth birthday on March the 11th. This sparked concern in the minds of both her family and her friends. 
Rosemary was reported missing to the Fishhook Police, where a search was immediately launched. It had now been a week since she was last seen, so they needed to work quickly. The police questioned everyone that Rosemary knew, including her daughters. Phoenix had told the police that it was normal for her mother to leave for a week or so at a time, explaining that she hadn't thought anything of it when her mother got into a car that Phoenix did not recognise. This was something that happened all the time. Phoenix had no idea that she should have taken note of who her mother was with or where she was going. Her absence seemed a little less alarming due to the fact that Rosemary had reached out to her friends the day after she left in the mysterious vehicle. However, after this, her phone was switched off. Phoenix said she had no idea that the man her mother left with could have been dangerous. The search continued for months, with no leads to be found. People tried everything they knew to find her. They held meetings, called renowned detectives and posted information and asked for help on social media. They put up posters, spent countless hours spreading the word and searching for any scrap of news. A Facebook page was started in her name where people could post encouragement or any updates of which they knew. They called her an angel, talking about how much they missed her and how they wished that she would be home safely soon. Phoenix contributed to this as well, talking about how she was doing her best to take care of her younger sister in her mother's absence, and how she was missing her every day. Rosemary's mother, Denise, couldn't handle the pain of not knowing the whereabouts of her daughter. As Rosemary's uncle cared for her, he reported how she went from cheerful and happy to extremely depressed. Both her mental and physical health declined as the days went on without her daughter. She lost her leg due to poor circulation, with Rosemary's uncle describing how Denise's mind no longer had the will to fight. As the days and months went by, speculation grew about who could have taken Rosemary from her family. They wondered if it was one of her exes or one of the fathers of her three children. Rosemary's three children each had different fathers and two of them struggled with illicit substance issues. It was possible that one of them had taken her in an inebriated rage. Some people believed that she had gotten into the car under false pretenses, fearing that she had been a victim of human trafficking. Although there was no merit to any of these theories, friends and family were trying their best to make sense of a situation that confused them so deeply. Can you imagine being in a similar situation? I can really just imagine finding any way to make this make sense. The realisation began to set in that she was likely not returning. Six months since her disappearance was marked on the calendars of her loved ones. It wasn't until September the 29th, 2013 that there would finally be an update in the case. On the beach of Stranfontaine Pavilion, a beautiful resort for vacations and surfing, a body was discovered. Upon further investigation, despite the decomposition, Rosemary Theron was identified as a woman in the shallow and sandy grave. A fog of shock and sadness was cast over the friends and family of the woman that they lovingly knew as Rosie. The shock only became more intense as people found out more about the situation and condition that Rosemary was discovered in. Godfrey Sheepers, a friend of Phoenix and boyfriend Kyle, walked into the Fishhook police station on the day of Rosemary's discovery. He detailed to the police about how Kyle had spoken to him. He talked about how he, Phoenix and her younger sister wanted to move out of Rosemary's house. Godfrey had offered up his home as a place for them to stay just for a temporary period of time until they made other plans. With this plan in mind, Kyle had called Godfrey to ask him to come over and help him move some of their belongings over to his house. Godfrey told the police that when he arrived to help Kyle and Phoenix move their things, they had expected him to help move more than he had bargained for. He revealed to the police that they also needed help moving Rosemary's body from the garden to another location. Even though he claimed he was taken aback by the request, he did actually help them transport Rosemary's body from the garden of her own home to the shallow grave on the beach in Stranfontaine. Then, a week ago, Godfrey Skippers walked into the Fishhook police station and confessed, leading the police to Tehran's decomposing body along Baden Powell Drive near the Strandfontein Pavilion. This was enough for police to arrest Phoenix and Kyle. 
and the true story of what happened on March the 7th became increasingly clear. After the argument between Phoenix, Kyle and Rosemary, the couple had hatched a plan to permanently remove Rosemary from the picture. Kyle had a lengthy history of fostering care homes, illicit substances and behavioural issues. Rosemary had made it known of her disapproval of Phoenix and Kyle's relationship, with the fear that Kyle would get Phoenix hooked on illicit substances too. This concern would, sadly yet quite predictably, prove to be true. After both partaking in said substances, Phoenix and Kyle put their twisted plan into motion. On that day, Rosemary actually did arrive back home after work. When she did arrive, Phoenix went to her and talked about the fight they had earlier that day. She hugged her mother, apologising for the disagreement. This hug between a mother and daughter was purely a smokescreen to position Rosemary for the rest of the plan. Kyle snuck up behind her with a rope in his hand. He then used the rope to stop Rosemary breathing. He counted out loud until four minutes had passed. Once Rosemary had taken her final breath, the two had wrapped her in a pink blanket, burying her quickly in the garden. They knew that this was not a permanent solution and that she would have to be moved later. And that is where Godfrey's story began. It was in this house that Kyle Maspero allegedly strangled Rosemary Tehran with the help of her own daughter, Phoenix, but it's up to the courts to get to the bottom of what actually happened that terrible night. Barbara Friedman, Cape Town. The trial began on Friday, April the 11th, 2014 and proved to be gruelling for everyone involved. Although Phoenix was a participant in the attack, Kyle was the one who had technically carried out the horrifying deed. Phoenix expressed serious remorse in her actions. She took a plea bargain where she pled guilty to her crimes and received just a 15-year prison sentence. Family members of Phoenix were in complete disbelief with her father reporting, how do I come to terms with this, this daughter that I adored and thought was the sweetest little girl in the world. Rosemary had previously detailed that she wanted her ashes to be placed in an organic urn, an urn where avocado seeds would be planted. She wanted to eventually be grown and transferred to a place where the poor could be fed, her legacy living on forever through good deeds. Angelique, Rosemary's sister, couldn't handle the tragedy that was unfolding around her. Two weeks after Rosemary's funeral, she sadly took her own life. Friends of Rosemary say that the demise of both Denise and Angelique is also on the hands of Phoenix and Kyle. Kyle's case was a more complex one. He was only 17 years old at the time of the attack on Rosemary. He was given a psychiatric evaluation. This was due to questions about how his illicit substance abuse might have affected his brain function. This delayed the trial for many months. The family and friends of Rosemary were tortured as the case dragged on without closure. A year and a half after the discovery of Rosemary's body, Kyle's trial had finally begun on October the 4th, 2015. Kyle was now 20 years old. Although he pleaded guilty to his hand in the ending of Rosemary, there were still ongoing arguments about his sentencing. Due to his age at the time, his defence asked for a light sentence. However, friends, family and prosecution strongly disagreed and pushed for him to be tried fully as an adult. The prosecution detailed how Kyle had not yet shown remorse for what he had done to Rosemary Theron, saying this was enough to give him the highest sentence possible. However, his age at the time of the event played to his advantage. Kyle broke down in the courtroom as he was given a sentence of just 13 years behind bars. The family was outraged by the short amount of time that was given. Grace Emmy Rose Mullane was born in Essex, England in 1996. She was born to parents David and Gillian. She was a family girl at heart. She was the youngest of three siblings and had two older brothers, Michael and Declan, who doted on her. In 2018, she graduated from the University of Lincoln with a degree in advertising and marketing. Her life was just beginning and she was excited to live it to the fullest. She had saved up for a year-long backpacking tour after her graduation, ready for an adventure before she started the next phase of her life. 
In October 2018, she travelled to South America for six weeks before landing in Peru. She was travelling alone, but she was never truly alone. She met up with other travellers along the way and was keen to share her journey with everyone back home. In November of that year, 21-year-old Grace arrived in Auckland, New Zealand. She checked into the base backpackers hostel on Queen Street and got ready for her next adventure. It was December the 1st, 2018. A Saturday evening, Grace left the hostel just before 6pm and headed out into the city centre. She was dressed up in a knee-length black dress, white shoes with a handbag tucked under her arm. She was meeting someone she had matched with on Tinder. Initially, she was reluctant to meet up, but after some more talking, she had come around to the idea. Drinks sounded good. Grace met her date at Sky City, an entertainment complex with bars, restaurants and a casino. It was busy, lively and the perfect place for a first date with a stranger. She was doing all the right things. By all accounts, the evening was going well. She texted her friend Amina back home saying, I click with him so well. He's an oil manager. He lives in a hotel. After 9.30pm, they both left the bar, arm in arm, and headed down the street. The next day was Grace's 22nd birthday. Her family and friends at home were sending messages and reaching out to her over social media. But Grace, unusually, wasn't responding to anyone. Her two phones were going straight to voicemail. Her brother Declan said she had been bombarding them with details and pictures of her trip so far, and with no response from her on her birthday, this was immediately alarming. Grace was a home bird, and this was a huge red flag. Her parents contacted the Auckland police and reported her as missing. Initially, the police didn't suspect any foul play. They had reached out to the hostel Grace was staying at. The hostel confirmed that she had not checked back in the night of December the first, but she was a young woman. She was travelling. The majority of her belongings were still at the hostel. Maybe she had just stayed with some new friends and forgotten to contact her parents. But fortunately for detectives, it didn't take long to track down where Grace had been on a Saturday evening. This was due to the vast amounts of CCTV from around the city. The mystery man she was spotted with that night was quickly identified. This man was Jesse Kempson a 26-year-old residing at the City Life Hotel in Auckland. As the last known person seen with Grace that night, the police knew that he was the man they needed to help fill in the gaps in the investigation. On the same day that Grace was reported missing, Jesse was asked to come into the station to answer some routine questions. Tell us about Grace, the police told Jesse. So I was talking to Grace on Tinder. We'd matched on Friday. I saw that we'd matched the next day on Saturday. And then we met at Sky City. When asked whose idea it was to head for Sky City, he said it was his. He was concerned about catfish online and wanted to feel safe. And there he was safe. What did you tell her about yourself? Uh, I just told her where my family were from. I told her what I did for work. Um, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. I asked her if she's visiting Sydney um, and she said she'd love to. How did the evening pan out? Mm, yeah, pretty good. He claimed that it was a good date. Nothing out of the ordinary had happened. It ended nicely with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. They made a plan for the following day and eventually parted ways at around 10pm. Jesse then described his route home, saying he walked down Queen Street. Wait, no, Victoria Street. Straight down to the bottom and then left and head towards the viaduct. When he had tried to message Grace the next day on Tinder, he noticed that Grace had unmatched him. The romance was over before it ever could have begun. He had hadn't seen Grace again since, and neither had anyone else. On December the 7th, David, Grace's father, made an emotional plea for help. As you know, Grace has been missing for several days. We last had contact with her on Saturday the 1st of December, and as a family we've been extremely concerned for her welfare. Grace is a lovely, outgoing, fun-loving, family-orientated daughter. Grace has never been out of contact for this amount of time. 
We are all extremely upset and it is very difficult at this time to fully describe the range of emotions we are going through. I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to anybody who has seen, spoken to or come into contact with Grace over the last few days and to come forward with any detail, no matter how, many, how small, and contact the investigation team. As police continued to search tirelessly, they looked to corroborate Jesse's story, but things weren't adding up. As the officers combed CCTV, frames from the City Life Hotel were raising more questions than they were answering. In six terabytes of CCTV data lay what really happened that night, and a sinister and disturbing picture was slowly put together. Jesse claimed the pair had parted ways on the street, that he had headed down Victoria Street alone, straight to the bottom, took a left and headed towards the viaduct, but the CCTV said otherwise. Jesse and Grace arrived at the City Life Hotel, together, at around 11pm. They exited the lift on Jesse's floor. They looked happy, cheerful, excited. But strangely, this was the last image of Grace that the police could find. They couldn't place her leaving the hotel the morning after. They could, however, place Jesse. On what was Grace's birthday, cameras picked up Jesse leaving the hotel. They tracked his every move over the coming hours. He left the hotel in the morning and went shopping to buy a suitcase. He then went to buy some cleaning supplies. Just before noon, he took a taxi to a car rental company. There he rented a red Toyota Corolla. Several hours later, he had another Tinder date. A popular man, it seems. His match later told police that he had made some disturbing comments on the date. The comments that made her feel so uneasy that she declined Jesse's offer. A disturbing offer of a ride in the red Toyota Corolla. She instead made her own way home. After his date, Jesse went into the city centre again, this time to hire a rug doctor. A rug doctor is a carpet cleaning machine. He had some red wine stains that needed cleaning up, he told the staff. He set off back to the city hotel to take care of his stains. And at 9.30pm, he loaded two suitcases onto a hotel trolley and offloaded them into the red Toyota Corolla he had rented earlier. At around 7am the next day, he was picked up on camera again, this time buying a shovel. Two hours later, he was spotted power washing the car before before returning it to the rental company. Even without a shred of physical evidence, the CCTV alone painted a disturbing picture. On the 5th of December, the day Grace was reported missing, Jesse was seen visiting various locations and dumping things in bins. Police arrived at the City Life Hotel looking to talk to him, and luckily just as they reached the front desk, Jesse returned to the hotel himself. But after catching sight of the police, he quickly turned around and began walking away trying to wriggle free from the hook with his head firmly facing the opposite direction. The police, however, saw him, caught him, and brought him in for questioning. This time, though, they were less forgiving, less willing to believe his words. By December the 8th, Jesse's story had drastically changed. This time he said that he and Grace had been having a good time on the date and had then returned to his hotel room to keep the party going. Amidst flirty text messages exchanged on Tinder, he claimed Grace had brought up Fifty Shades of Grey. Jesse went on to tell police that the two had begun having intimate relations, but that Grace wanted to experiment. According to Jesse, she wanted to try bondage. They ended up on the floor and she had asked him to hold her throat. He then went for a shower and fell asleep. When he had awoken the next morning, he realised that Grace was no longer breathing. In a state of shock, he panicked and put her body in a suitcase before later burying it. Whether his story was true or not, the police didn't need to wait any longer. They had their man. On the 8th of December, Jesse Kempston was arrested. Jesse was a 26-year-old man born in Wellington. He moved around frequently as a child due to his parents' separation. He was also a compulsive liar. Jesse would lie about pretty much everything from being related to a famous rugby player to having cancer. He lied to his employers, landlords, partners and even his friends and family. His lies would catch up with him frequently and he would often be evicted from his flats and lose jobs. One former landlord of Jesse described how 
he claimed to be a professional softball player, someone who had been signed up by New Zealand's national softball team, the Black Sox. Another landlord at the City Life Hotel was told that Jesse was a top manager for Woolworths, but in reality, his rent was being paid by state benefits. Jesse's last job was in telephone sales, but not surprisingly, he was dismissed due to his lies. He was dismissed on the same day that he met Grace Mullane on December the 1st. It didn't take long for the police to start searching a scenic area near the Waitakere Reservoir later that day. And just 10 yards from the road, they found a body. Sadly, it was Grace. After the formal identification process, the grief was shared throughout the nation, and thousands of people paid tribute to Grace and held visuals. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern publicly apologised to Grace's parents. She offered her and her country's full support. Firstly, I cannot imagine the grief of her family and what they will be experiencing and feeling right now. And my Thoughts and prayers are with her father, David, um, who is in the country, um, her mother, Gillian, who cannot be here, uh, and her wider family, friends uh, and loved ones. You know, from uh, the Kiwis I have spoken to, there is this overwhelming sense of hurt and shame that this has happened in our country, a place that prides itself on our hospitality, on our manaakitanga, um, especially to those who are visiting our shores. And so, on behalf of New Zealand, I want to apologise to Grace's family. Your daughter should have been safe here, and she wasn't, and I'm sorry for that. I've advised the family through the police that if there is anything we can do to assist, we are here to help with that. On the 10th of December, just five days after Grace was reported missing, Jesse Kempson was formally charged with the murder. His master plan, his web of lies, crumbled around him. Yet he still pleaded not guilty. At his court appearance, he was granted an interim name suppression to ensure a fair trial. The trial began in November and lasted just three weeks. Throughout the trial, Jesse remained stony-faced. He showed no emotion, occasionally glancing down at court papers or holding his head in his hands. Jesse's defence team argued that Grace's death was caused by nothing more than consensual intimate acts that had gone horribly wrong. They claimed that Grace had engaged in intimate encounters like this before. This was a simple yet tragic case of an adult misadventure, and after it happened, Jesse just panicked. It was not a murder, but an accidental death. The prosecution argued otherwise. They said that Jesse did not panic, and this was not simply something that went wrong. It was very clearly deliberate and intentional. Following an autopsy, a pathologist confirmed that Grace had been throttled. They said that she had bruises on her arms and chest. These were said to be consistent with being pinned down with considerable force. They would have required a lot of pressure on the neck. And this pressure must have lasted between four and five minutes to be enough to end her life. While Jesse stated that he had gotten into the shower before falling asleep after their night together, his phone history suggested otherwise. At around 1.30am on Sunday, as Grace lay lifeless in his room, Jesse browsed the internet. He looked up how to make the hottest fire. He searched for flesh-eating birds and tried to learn about the Waitakere Rangers, the people that patrolled the location where he would later bury the body. Jesse then trawled through adult websites. Lastly, he took several intimate photos of Grace's body. This really was the final nail in his coffin. Despite his protests of innocence, on the 22nd of December 2019, Jesse Kempson was found guilty of ending Grace's life. The judge told him, You are a large and powerful man. She was diminutive in those circumstances. Due to the highly publicised trial, two women had gone to the police. When they saw blurred images of Jesse, they recognised him. They both had their own horrific stories to tell. In October 2020, an ex-partner spoke of the physical, intimate, emotional and financial maltreatment she had suffered while with him. He would hold sharp implements to her neck, throttle her, force her to perform intimate acts and drain her bank account. In November 2020, he was put on trial yet again, this time for violating a young British tourist he had met 
met on Tinder eight months before he had met Grace. He was found guilty in both cases. For the ending of Grace's life, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 17 years. For the two 2020 cases, he received a total of 11 years. These were run concurrently alongside the sentence he received for the murder of Grace. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99p. A huge thank you to my patrons. Your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.